morning. This meeting is called to order. Uh, welcome to our last set board meeting of the season. Our meetings are going to continue to be hybrid. HCA staff will be on site when possible. Board members and other attendees have the option of attending on site or via Zoom. Our Zoom attendees, our opening slide is information about how you can turn on closed captioning subtitles. We're going to do roll call, uh, starting with Pam. Good morning. Terry. Good morning. Allison. Good morning. Myra. Good morning. Donna. Good morning. And Terry? No Terry yet? Okay. We'll be no, I know. I'm going to, I just want to make sure Terry. Yeah. There, well, I got this. <laughs> All right. And uh, if Terry pops on, just let me know and then we'll, we'll introduce. Amy. Good morning. And Omi. Morning. Good morning. And Katie Hatfield from the HEO. Hello. And I'm Lou McDermott. I'm the deputy director here at HCA, and I am the chair of the set board. With board members attending both virtually and in person, it would be helpful for board members to hold their questions until each presentation is done or when the presenter pauses and asks for questions. Board members attending virtually will be watching for your Zoom hand in case you have a question. There are going to be several resolutions scheduled for action today, and the public will have an opportunity to provide comments on those specific resolutions during normal procedure before the board votes. The public is also going to have an opportunity at the end during the public comment period. As a reminder, if the public has questions during the presentations, the presenter's contact information is included at the end of the presentation, and the public's welcome to email the presenters during the meeting to capture the questions for response after the meeting. What do we got going on, Dave? Good morning, Chair McDermott, members of the board. Today, um, as you said, this is the last meeting of this board season, the earliest I think we've ever ended our board season, but it will help us pivot to open enrollment um, a little bit more. Uh, so we have multiple resolutions for your action related to premiums for the 2025 uh, plan year. And then we immediately pivot to open enrollment and Alyssa will share um, some of our preparations that have been underway for several weeks. I feel like I'm echoing. Uh, I don't think you are. Okay, it's just maybe like <laughs> echoing in my ears. Do you hear an echo, Gene? Okay. Do you okay. want to switch? Uh, do you want to switch boxes? No, I'll just deal with it if it's not bothering anybody else. Um, we'll have Alyssa talk about open enrollment, um, and then I uh, uh, let the board know that last meeting that we would be having a conversation here today about the status of the consolidation report. Uh, so the legislature charged the agency with the consolidation report of the PEP and SEP programs on a couple of specific topics. Um, we are in the midst of working on drafting all of that. Uh, at the same time, we have some topics to go over that are stakeholdering, and we're kind of kicking off our stakeholdering process with the two boards today and tomorrow. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that stakeholdering process when Kate comes up. Um, then we have Ellen Wolfhagen, who oversees the Medicare portfolio and contracts in the PEP program. Um, we just like to keep you apprised of general happenings there, since, as I always say, uh, SEP employees generally graduate and have um, most times eligibility for PEP retiree benefits. So we just like you to be aware of the uh, results when an individual retires um, and what's going on at the PEP side of the house. And then I will uh, be a finalized the 2025 agenda, so you can start marking your calendars. Um, a quick housekeeping reminder. If we have an emergency, we will walk purposefully um, across the street. We won't dawdle, but we won't run either uh, to the parking lot across the street. Been working on that script all season. I finally settled on that version. And at the same time, if you need the restroom, also walk purposefully down the hall and look at the left when you see the elevators. Uh, I do have one other topic that is not on the agenda that this is probably the best place to bring up. Uh, and it's, an, uh, it's a topic that involves the intersection of the PEB and SEP programs. And it is something that has been brought to the agency's attention in recent weeks and revealed a disconnect um, between the two programs. And uh, so that disconnect uh, is about the ability of a to waive SEB employee coverage to stay enrolled on PEB retiree insurance. So think about it that you have an individual who is currently on PEB retiree insurance. And the classic scenario that's coming up is and they want to part-time substitute. And then at some point in the school year, they reach 630 hours. There's an offer of coverage for SEB employer-sponsored um, insurance that is required. And uh, whether those individuals can waive that coverage in the SEB program and stay on PEB retiree insurance coverage or whether they 
are not allowed to waive that coverage and stay on PEP retiree insurance coverage. So that is the topic that has come up. So it starts with CMS. And CMS has federal requirements that apply and are designed to prevent employers from A, incentivizing Medicare coverage um, over other employer-sponsored medical coverage, and B, from shifting healthcare costs from employers to Medicare. So that's the starting point of kind of the federal regulatory environment. And you can probably see where this is going, that the waiver isn't allowed. Um, so CMS regulations also specifically address temporary employment situations or short-term periods where um, employer-sponsored coverage is available, kind of the exact scenario that we're talking about. And so these federal requirements really limit the options that are available between the PEV and SEP programs to address retirees who are rehired and work part-time but desire to maintain uninterrupted PEP coverage. But let's be clear, people may want to stay in the PEP coverage, retiree coverage, so that their accumulators don't restart. They, you know, if they come over to employer sponsored, they start their deductible over in, in many instances. And then after that, the start of the school, new school year, if they're not anticipated to work, then they're coming back onto PEP retiree coverage and their deductibles are rebooting. Uh, so that's, you know, part of that, that movement back and forth can be very uh, bumpy between for, for the member and understandable why they may want to stay for short-term periods. But it doesn't really comport with federal um, Medicare rules. So earlier this year, the PEB board passed a resolution. It was 2024-11 that added the eligibility for the employer contribution in SEB as a reason for automatically deferring PEB retiree coverage um, insurance. And when somebody is becoming eligible for that employer contribution, both in PEB and SEB going forward, they would automatically be deferred in PEB retiree insurance coverage. So if you think about it, the scenario is, the way people have looked at this question is, can you waive SEB to stay in PEB retiree insurance coverage? And the answer is no, because that doesn't fit the Medicare secondary payer rules. And instead, we, we the the procedure that has been in place for PEB and now will also be in place for SEB employer contribution benefits would be to put them in, put the retiree in waiver status over the PEB program. So the original intent of that resolution was to eliminate the need for the now school employee to have to fill out a piece of paper to tell the agency they wanted to defer their PEB coverage. Uh, so we were seeing it as a paperwork reduction process. But the resolution brought to light a disconnect at HCA because HCA leadership, myself included, believed that sub employees were already prohibited from waiving sub school employee medical coverage to remain in PEP retiree coverage. Uh, and therefore, again, we believe that it was the resolution was about reducing paperwork for the new school employee. But it's recently become we've recently become aware that that understanding was in fact not correct, and HCA was allowing sub employees to voluntarily elect to waive that sub school employee coverage in order to remain on PEB retiree coverage. And that recent awareness, as I've been previewing, um, revealed that inconsistency between current practice and the federal requirements. And HCA can't allow persons eligible for the employer contribution and SEP benefits to waive that coverage and remain on PEB because that would likely be seen as an impermissible cost shifting to uh, medical cost into uh, Medicare. We understand now that this represents a change from the perspective of benefits administrators and school districts, retirees, and even my own customer service team. Um, because we have certain set program rules that actually don't expressly prohibit the waiver and in some instances suggest that it is permissible. And so those rules and policies are actually in the midst of being changed um, effective September 1st so that they align with the federal requirements. We're still learning a lot about this topic. This really came to light in the last two weeks. Um, we were under the impression that there was the complete prohibition, and then we learned that there was this ability that had been exercised since the SEP program launched that was allowing this waiver situation. So it's still pretty fresh. There's a lot of questions that are coming in for benefits administrators. There's a lot of retirees, a number of retirees, especially at the end of the school year, as they were hitting 630 hours and substituting in May or June that were running into this, and it was being highlighted because the resolution that passed that board. So the effective date of all these changes is going to be September 1st of 2024 to align with the next school year. That way, as eligibility and hiring determinations are being made and 
of retirees are thinking about hours that they want to pick up throughout the school year. They understand the rules of the road um, kind of going forward. We are working on more communications. Um, there's some things that we're hoping to get drafted and out to benefits administrators to understand later this week. And they're very likely going to need to be more policy conversations, possibly for rulemaking to kind of address and clean up the scenario. But the reason that I wanted to bring it to you today is there are definitely um, some um, stakeholders and benefits administrators who think that the SEP board should allow the waiver. And they've asked us, why, why is it SEP doing, why is it the board doing something to help in this situation? And the reality is the board doesn't have the ability to set up that waiver process because that would be directly in conflict with the secondary payer rules for Medicare and that cost shifting issue. So the agency, as I said, we were under the impression that we had set up the system to prevent the waiver in both programs. We set up the prohibition and all of the PEP rules very clearly, didn't set it up as clearly in the SEP rules, and that resulted in this disconnect between practice and policy. So that's what I have to prepare. Uh, and Donna, first question. What if the person is in PEP, but they're not qualified for Medicare yet? So you're talking about a non-Medicare retiree. So <laughs> what I would say to an individual who's literally, the rules will apply in both scenarios because it's all about all the, the, the rules will apply to all retiree insurance coverage in PEP. So it won't matter whether you're non-Medicare or Medicare. The reason that I would I would have you look, or as someone in your situation, not as say, if you were looking at going into PEP non-Medicare coverage, it's quite expensive, much more expensive than if you accepted, if you were eligible in the SEP program for employer-sponsored benefits, you'd have a much lower monthly premium. And I'd be curious what would compel someone to pay four, five, six times a monthly premium for similar coverage. In the event, in the event you were already have met all your um, maximum out of pocket, possibly in the middle of something, you know, resetting the all monthly, your deductibles. Monthly premiums. Yeah. The monthly premiums would monthly be. Monthly premiums. Would, oh yeah. Like, that would be the yeah. decider. It could be quite. I mean, we're, in some instances, for two people, it's over a thousand dollars. Um, for, for you and a spouse in the non-Medicare setting, whereas if you have the eligibility in SEP or, or in PEP, it's, it's both either program. If you have eligibility for the employer sponsor con the employer medical contribution, it substantially subsidizes the coverage and greatly lowers the premium. I suppose it's theoretically possible that depending on the time of year, how much runway is left in the calendar year, it could technically be more beneficial to stay for PEP than to cut over to set in theory. In the non-Medicare setting. Yes. The system is designed to not distinguish between non-Medicare and Medicare on this point. The, the, the prohibition that exists in PEP today and will be in effect in SEV come September 1st doesn't distinguish those scenarios. It's if you are in have retiree insurance coverage, whether Medicare or non-Medicare, you can't waive the uh, the the employer contribution elsewhere. And as a reminder, in these scenarios, the school district or the state agency still pays the funding rate for the eligible employee. So this retire so in the in the in what's been happening where some individual retirees have been gaining eligibility near the end of the school year and waiving their sub employee coverage and staying on PEB currently, the district has been paying the funding rate for those individuals. There's no incentive for the district to encourage one way or the other the way that they all, that the district or the employer always pays the funding rate, regardless of whether the individual accepts uh, eligibility, make sure that there's not any concern about um, an incentive by the employer to push somebody one way or the other on this issue. Amy has a question. Amy. Good morning. Um, so I actually do have a question on this. Um, with, uh, what what is the process i guess um and that's one thing that we really need to think of because um if you have an employee uh who became benefit eligible in and especially around school districts they don't become benefit eligible until the end of the school year as subs who are retirees because they work here and there so when you have an employee who's literally going to be offered benefits for one to two months for SEB coverage, and then that SEB coverage is going to end. And so now we're, def or now we're deferring their 
retiree coverage, losing their, if they've paid their deductible, losing all of that, starting SEB for one to two months, terming them, and them having to reapply and re-get on the retiree coverage. It is a, I mean, there are many people who literally, and as a benefit administrator, uh, I'll put this nicely, uh, speak very strongly towards me on not wanting to lose retirement coverage, even if it's cheaper for a month or two, because it's so much work and so much process. And the SEB system will not, as of right now, it does not work. Benefit administrators have to put in tickets to be able to get this all taken care of. And then the system has to be um, done a bunch of stuff on the back end by the um, outreach and training. A and it just becomes a, quite a mess. And I've had employees who had to do this last year who were livid. Um, and now this year, I'm starting to get to that point where we're going to be having some. And I know they're going to be livid again because it's sometimes the same people. And sometimes not. I mean, of course, they're always new. So it, I would like to understand or um, have more communication to benefit administrators on how this is going to work. Uh, and how do how do school districts explain this? How does PEB explain this to their employees on the benefits and the and what their what their responsibility is? Uh, Amy, I think that's the key piece is I'm going to draw an analogy to uh, DRS and the re retire rehire rules. DRS has a robust communication to help people understand what the implications are of the choice that they make to take on X number of hours. And if you go over X, this is what it means for your pension and educate you and then you make the choice of knowingly understanding what happens to your pension if you cross a certain threshold. That's what we're understanding is needing to, going to be happen, need to happen here as well. And the, the rules in pension and health are very different and people may want them to be the same, but they also aren't the same. But the concept is the same that, that the agency is, is gonna to have to work on communicating to PEB retirees the rules of the road of if you are working in a school district and you reach that magic number of 630, let's, let's say you're not anticipated to work that um, at the beginning of the year, so you don't get an eligibility determination for benefits at the beginning of the school year, but you have to be aware that there is a choice that is made if you cross the 630 threshold at the end of the year. This is, um, this is, this is what happens, and this is how your insurance will shift, and that you will bounce in and out, and that may prompt many people to say, "I'm going to sub up to 629 hours." Uh, but they need to understand the implications, just as they, uh, as DRS communicates the retiree hire rules for impacts on pension benefits. I think one of the issues, though, for benefit administrators is we don't know who's on the retiree coverage. Right. We have no we have no notification, no nothing. We just this employee who is retired comes in. We don't even know if they're taking it or not. They come in, they start subbing for us. You know, we tell we give them the hey, you're not eligible. But uh, yeah, the, whether they read it or not is one thing. But, you know, it, it just it's difficult to not be able to inform employees what's going to happen if, if as benefit administrators, we don't know what's going to happen. So, Dave, are there any mechanisms that the school district could use to avoid that, like 1099 or something like that? Is there any, is there any way to contract with an individual to avoid that? Um, you mean, are you, I'm not like, sure that there's you're... different ways to hire people, right? You know, you can hire them as employees, you can hire them as contractors. Does it apply? Is it the same for both? I think I'll have to get back to you on that. I have some guesses, but this is not an area to guess on a topic. <laughs> what I would say is I have some ideas about some ways that might be able to help districts understand, as to your point, Amy, who is in retiree coverage. Um, I'm thinking about how in benefits 24 seven, there's a Medicare indicator that many VAs said, what is this field that I've never seen before? It wasn't an SMA. And we might be able to leverage something like that as a way for VAs to understand who is in head retiree coverage. So there might be an opportunity uh, to help elucidate that uh, within, within benefits 24 seven going forward. So that's something that can be explored as well. Uh, so that was one thing that I was thinking about, but, but I definitely, there is a piece here 
that we need as an agency and, and program to be communicating this nuance, especially in SEB where the threshold is 630 hours so that people know what happens if they actually accept those hours. Uh, I saw Pam and then Donna and then Allison. I know you're at the beginning stages of getting this information out. Do we know approximately how many people this will impact? So you have a nice round-ish number. Um, looking back, since this has been going on to some extent for four and a half years, um, it's typically about 100 people, around 100 per year. Um, that's not a unique, uh, that is a unique count. Um, so some, that, that's the interesting thing is when we looked at the data as to individuals that, this, that have been in this scenario that have, are sitting in our system as waived at SEB, but are enrolled in PEP retiree, we see a variety of different people. We see people who bounce in for two or three months, but we also see more people than you might expect that have been on PEP retiree coverage and waived in SEB for four and a half years. They've essentially been fully eligible for SEB for four and a half years, but not taking the SEB coverage and instead have been staying on PEP retiree insurance for four and a half years. And we see people who are on for maybe two school years. There's, there's, there are people who are on for long periods of time that it's I'd be curious to understand their thinking behind staying in one if they are for several years essentially being a enough of a uh, working enough hours to have an anticipated to work eligibility determination in September year over year over year over year. They may not be a full-time worker, but they're meeting the requirements for sub benefits eligibility and then turning down that higher employer contribution for their medical insurance for years. Thank you. But about a hundred. That was yeah. my question as well. Yeah. I just was curious, what's the total number again? Um, I just as, cause this seems like a small number in the grand it's percentage. About, it's so. about 400 people over the last. No, I mean, year, but, um, over how many people are in SEB in oh, total? Oh, in SEB total. Um, for the, since we're talking to this, I don't know, I guess I'm not sure if we need to talk member lives or subscriber lives. Um, uh, it's the subscribers are about 148,000, 149,000. So it is a small number of that, um, of that population. Donna? Same question. <laughs> Other questions for Dave? Are, there gonna, are you going to be sending updates out to the board as we continue to unfurl this? Yeah, as, yeah. I, I wanted to, it's still kind of raw and fresh and working through some things, but it's, it's the last board meeting of the season. I didn't want to just walk away and then we start sending more communications out to BAs and, you know, two to three days and then be like, why didn't this big topic between the programs not come up? So I wanted to start to, like you said, Lou, unfurl it now. But we send out a BA communication forward that to the board members so that you're aware of that. And as we progress on this, there'll, there'll need to be updates. I don't know how much in the off season versus in January, but there'll be pieces that we want everybody to know. Any more on this topic? Dave, thank you. All right, let's go ahead and approve any, any more, Dave? Nope. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to approve the June 20th, 2024 meeting minutes. Uh, they are behind tab number three. Do we have any comments from the board? Do I have a motion to approve the minutes as written? This is Allison. I'll move that motion. Is there a second? I approve second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. The June 20th, 2024 minutes are approved as written. Next up, Tanya Duell. Our finance manager in FSB is bringing back five 2025 set premium resolutions for us to vote on today. After she reviews the resolution, I'm going to ask for a motion to adopt. Within a second, we're going to ask the public comment on the resolution. We're going to have any more discussions from the board. And uh, her materials are behind tab number four. Tanya, welcome. Thank you. Good morning, Chair McDermott, members of the board. Kind of excited. It's our last meeting. So I'm here today to um, ask the board to take action on the premium resolutions for plan year 2025. Um, but first up, um, we have a late breaking change that I'm going to bring back on behalf of Christine. 
um, when Christine was here on the 20th, we weren't aware of this change at the time. So I'm just wrapping it into my presentation as a follow-up. Um, so both Kaiser Northwest and Kaiser Washington have been contracting with several wellness and mental health apps over the last year, uh, the last few years, including Carrot, Calm, My Strength, and Headspace Care. They are not going to be renewing their contract with My Strength, which is a tool to manage stress, depression, sleep, um, and then some. So the contract will end July 31st of this year, but members who are currently using the app can continue to use the app through the end of the year. After July, any new members will not be able to enroll into the app. However, Kaiser is going to notify members that are using this app of the change and help them explore alternative self-care apps that they still will offer, including Calm and Headspace Care and things like that. So just wanted to bring that change back because it was not discussed previously. So next up is just a reminder of the premiums. I know we've had um, some good conversations of the 2025 employee premium. So I just wanted to bring these back as a reminder and give space for the board to ask any follow-up questions here, um, because then I will turn it over to Chair McDermott to walk through the resolutions. As a reminder, the resolutions are separated one per carrier. So there'll be a resolution asking the board to authorize the, the premiums for 2025 by carrier. The fully insured carriers, those will include any underlying benefit design changes that Christine described on the 20th. Those are included in those resolutions by the board adopting the premiums. So are there any questions on premiums before I turn it over to Chair McDermott? It's always a quick one on these. Turning it back over. All right, here we go. Resolve that. Uh... Oh, I'm sorry. Resolution set 2024-09, uh, Kaiser Foundation Plan of Northwest, uh, KP Northwest 2025 Medical Premiums Resolve. Set board authorizes the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of the Northwest 2025 Employee Premiums. Is there a motion to adopt? This is Allison. I move that motion. Is there a second? Pam Cruz, second. Any comments from the audience? Nope. Any additional comments from the board? All right, roll call vote, starting with Pamela. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Allison. Aye. Myra. Aye. Donna. Aye. Is Terry with us, Mackenzie? Nope. Amy. Aye. Amy. Aye. Amy McDermott. Aye. Resolution 2024-09 passes. Going. Just keep rolling. <laughs> Resolution set 2024-10 Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Washington 2025 medical premiums resolve. The set board authorizes the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Washington 2025 employee premiums. Is there a motion to adopt? Pam Cruz, I move. So move. Is there a second? This is Donna. I second it. Any comments from the audience? Seeing none. Any comments from the board? We'll call vote. Uh, Pamela. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Allison. Aye. Myra. Aye. Donna. Aye. Terry. Amy. Sorry. Amy. Aye. Uh, Omi. Aye. Amy, aye. Resolution 2024-10 passes. Next up, resolution 2024-11, resolved that the SEB board authorizes the Kaiser Foundation Health Plan of Washington Options, Inc., 2025 employee premiums. Is there a motion to adopt? This is Donna, I so move. Is there a second? I am here second. Any comments from the audience? Seeing none, any comments from the board? Seeing none. It's a roll call vote, starting with Pamela. Aye. Carrie. Aye. Allison. Aye. Myra. Aye. Donna. Aye. Amy. Aye. Amy. Aye. And Lou. Aye. Resolution 2024-11 passes. Next up, set up 2024-12. Resolved that the set board authorizes the Primera 2025 employee premiums. Is there a motion to adopt? Am Cruz, so moved. Is there a second? This is Donna. I second it. 
Any comments from the audience? Seeing none, any comments from the board? Voting starting with Pamela. Aye. Harry. Aye. Allison. Aye. Myra. Aye. Donna. Aye. Terry. Amy. Aye. Me. Aye. And Lou. Aye. Resolution 2024-12 passes. Next up, Resolution SEP 2024-13 resolved that the SEP board authorizes the Uniform Medical Plan 2025 employee premiums. Is there a motion to adopt? Without I make that motion. Is there a second? Yeah, there's a second. Any comments from the audience? Seeing none. Any comments from the board? And the vote, Pamela? Aye. Carrie? Aye. Allison? Aye. Myra? Aye. Donna? Aye. Amy? Aye. Omi? Aye. And Lou? Aye. Resolution 2024-13 passes. Thank you. Nice Thank job. You. Yeah. You didn't do anything. You nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> Always a little anticlimactic in some way, but yeah. that's actually good news, I think, when it's anticlimactic is probably what I should say. Uh, but it goes without saying that there's a lot of work that leads up to this point, especially if some member of the public tunes in for the first time and they're like, wow, that was really fast. There's, um, you know, there's a journey across a series of meetings that brings us to the point of the board being able to act in a rather succinct and quick manner. And I just thank you for your work on this because we now have plans for 2025. That's always the reminder that if you voted no, there were no plans. Um, the starting point every year is we build it from the ground up. So uh, on, on the medical side. So we now have plans. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. All right. Open a little bit of review. We have June, Jean Bowie, the deputy for. Uh, the Herb Division is going to be talking about some information regarding preparations for the SEP program open enrollment this fall and her materials behind tab number five. Uh, Jean is pinch hitting for Elisa today. Nice job, Jean. You've been pinch hitting a couple of times this year. <laughs> All purpose. Yes, designated hitter, yes. <laughs> five tool player there. <laughs> Good morning, Chairman. If you'd like to play for the Mariners, they could use a little help right now. <laughs> I mean, it's true. The best part is she was actually sort of preparing to pitch it for a different presentation today, and so she got this one this morning. <laughs> Good morning, Chair McDermott and members of the board. For the record, my name is Jean Bowie, and I am the Herb Deputy Director. I'm here today to give you a preview of the open enrollment strategies in the Employees and Retirees Benefits Division. Open enrollment planning activities start months before the open enrollment period. Many divisions within the healthcare authority work together to plan for a successful open enrollment. This year's open enrollment for SEB will be, and as well as PEB, Monday, October 28th uh, through Monday, November 25th at 11.59 p.m. In, Mar <clears throat> in March, we begin meeting with the various areas of the healthcare authority to discuss open enrollment tasks. These planning tasks include communication materials, planning for open enrollment system updates, and um, uh, scheduling the um, benefits fairs. Starting in April, the planning for upcoming benefits fairs begins. The outreach and training team facilitate these discussions and start planning for the number of fairs, the locations based on member enrollment data, and securing venues for the benefits fairs, and working with internal staff to plan for support for on-site uh, engagement during each of the fairs. In June, the ERB communications team facilitate, uh, finalizes their communications plan for the, uh, uh, the open enrollment materials. In July, the board votes on premiums, which kicks off our ability to finalize materials for open enrollment. In August, the HCA finance and communications teams finalize rate sheets and the communications plan gets finalized based on the decisions made in July. Next slide, please. The outreach and training team works directly with seven organization benefits administrators. The team supports over 700 PEB agencies and several organizations. 
They provide training to organizations regarding program plan options, covered benefits, eligibility, rules and enrollment processes. In turn, organizations act as the first line of customer service for their employees. When benefits administrators need assistance, they reach out to outreach and train, the outreach and training unit for support either by calling our toll-free line or sending a secure message through HCA support. The team works on an open enrollment year-round for strategies and process improvements. We use member feedback to help with these planning activities. No, Jane, I do want to acknowledge because I'm, I'm sitting here thinking about a benefit administrator who might be listening in on the presentation that uh, it sounds great on paper that the outreach training unit is the area for support, but we also acknowledge that there still is a lot of um, individual syncing issues with benefits 24 seven and the back end pay one accounting system that has tickets that are, um, there's a large volume of tickets, especially for the staffing level that we have. And so the turnaround time there is understandably frustrating for VAs. I just wanted to acknowledge that part of it rather than simply glossing over. It's like, oh, the VAs reach out to OT and it's, you know, rainbows and sunshine. There is still a lot of work that is going on there. It is the way the system works, and uh, but there is that that uh, stress in that area right now, um, and we're kind of working through some um, ideas to to try to uh, create some of that pressure because we know that there will be, as always, some sort of bow wave that comes in an open enrollment. So we want to kind of clear the deck as best as we can in anticipation of the the inevitable OE bow wave. So just wanted to add that context. The customer service unit is the first line of contact for retirees and continuation coverage employees. Staff perform three primary functions, answering the phone calls via the toll-free line uh, and responding to HCA support inquiries. They also provide in-person lobby service here at Cherry Street Plaza for walk-in members. They review members' retiree or continuation coverage eligibility as they process enrollment forms. During open enrollment, any changes requested by retirees or continuation coverage members are submitted and the customer service staff review those changes and can put them into the system for January 1st, 2025. Customer service team has 27 medical assistant specialist three positions, which are all currently filled. All of our Mass 3 staff will be fully trained by the start of open enrollment this year. That is, we don't have anybody who leaves, which I yeah. always happens. I think we actually just had somebody who turned in, but they were moving on. So I think we have 26 of 27 positions filled, always changing. But to, to provide a little context, we only had tr nine trained staff during the open enrollment for 2022, and then we had 20 for 2023. So we are looking better for 2024. <laughs> Next slide, please. Every year, the Outreach and Training Unit conducts webinars for benefits administrators to help prepare them for open enrollment. These webinars will also be recorded and later posted on the Benefits Administrator Training webpage. Once the dates of the webinars are finalized, they will be shared and advertised with benefits administrators. The Outreach and Training Unit will provide forwardable email messages to to uh, benefits administrators who in turn send them out to all employees. These messages include important information such as open enrollment timelines, change, changes for plan year 2025, and information about how to make changes during open enrollment. Benefits administrators communicate with outreach and training through the HCA support form. Next slide. Last year, we hosted 15 benefits fairs across the state. We received a lot of member feedback, which we used to start planning fairs for this year. Location for this year's benefits fairs were selected based on member enrollment data. I've included the dates, times, and locations on the next slide, and we'll go over them shortly. Based on feedback we received, we are working with our communications team to have printed materials available at the first benefits fair, as well as on our website. 
We're also planning to increase our staffing at the fairs to help support the needs of our members. We started planning earlier for more of our program staff to attend to address member questions. For the fairs this year, we have the fairs scheduled for any member to come during at any point of the day. Um, you may recall previous years we had a segment of time that was for retirees or PEB and then SEP. So we've you know, um, now opened it up that anybody can come at any time during the day of the fair. This year again, we will offer virtual benefits fairs. The virtual benefits fairs is an online website created with the same goal in mind as an in-person benefits fair. Some of the uh, virtual benefits fair features include that members can learn about the benefits from their home these uh, fair, the fair information is available anytime, day or night, and can be ac accessed via computer, tablet, or smartphone. And some of the carriers provide direct interactive webinars, pre recorded webinars, and teleconferences to share plan, uh, plan specific information. And as I mentioned on this slide, you will see the dates, times, and cities for the 15 benefits fairs hosted by HCA. In addition to the HCA hosted benefits fair, UW, uh, University of Washington hosts uh, benefits fairs at the uh, prior to open enrollment each year. And these will um, would be useful for retiring SEP members to, uh, to attend uh, to you know, get information on the uh, PEP reti uh, retiree plans. And those dates and times will be on our website prior to open enrollment. The reason we didn't include more of the University of Washington information is for the bread and butter active state employee, the, the information that you might expect from all of the carriers won't be there because it's hosted by UW for PEP employees, but we recognize that school employees who are about to retire, that information would be there inherently. So we're trying not to advertise it as much in the subcontext because if you were to just go, you might not have, you, you could find out about Primera's Medicare options, um, but you wouldn't be able to find out about Primera's school employee options because the benefit, the audience intended isn't isn't SEP. Um, but about to retire, SEP employees could leverage those. And just for context, those four fairs are at various UW facilities for review, the main campus, and a couple of other facilities in this gallery. Okay, next slide. This year, we have a similar communication strategy as uh, what we had done last year. We will have uh, social media posts, forwardable email messages shared for them to send to employees, retiree association presentations, the retiree customized letter, an alert banner in benefits 24 seven. And we will include a website alert on the front of hca.wa.gov so members can easily go to the open enrollment web pages to view important changes. We will be using the October newsletter to call out information members need to be aware of when considering plans for 2025. Another communication strategy that I'm excited to share with the board is um, internally we've had a work group that has been um, trying to address beef up our communication around behavioral health services. Uh, so we're still working through some of those materials, but I'm, you know, one of our goals for this open enrollment is to have more robust information for people to understand behavioral health services, um, what's included, uh, and be able to see words that resonate with them. Um, one of the one of the classic things that we've been hearing is, you know, when you look at our benefit comparison chart, for example, and you see inpatient and outpatient cost shares, and you see it in the context of a medical chart that doesn't scream to people's minds, oh, I need substance use disorder inpatient treatment, it's that same line. You think of it as admittance for surgery or something like that. And so we're working on making sure that it's more um, apparent to people which subset of services, when it crosses that line between what might people might think is more classic medical um, services versus behavioral services, making sure that people understand what words mean and what they apply to. Uh, so we, we do have this emphasis of a work group that we've been working on that and and 
coordinating with our Division of Behavioral Health Services, which is uh, another great partnership here at HCA. So excited about that push um, that in, in our communications this year. And it's 24 seven. So in order to prepare the benefits 24 seven system for open enrollment, our benefits 24 seven team will complete performance testing uh, ensuring the system operates as expected with a large volume of members during the moment. Uh, for the program, we are currently working on with the new uh, carved out vision and the UMP Classic Medicare with Part D development. The, the development has been completed and the team has begun extensive, extensive system testing, uh, including validation carriers on the data that is transmitted to them. We are working on in, in interface testing to test and improve the interface between Benefits 24-7 and the K-1 backend system. Carrier file testing uh, is ongoing to ensure that the files are uh, going to the carriers uh, with the new values and regu regular language updates such as the plan changes and uh, if there are any county updates and rate updates. And interface testing is code for addressing syncing issues as best as we can, just to put a fine point on there. Next slide, please. So there are some ways a member can prepare themselves for open enrollment. For members considering changing their plans, the best way to prepare is to make sure that you can log into your the online account in Benefits 24-7. Consider signing up for email communications. Write a list of the important questions that you may have for the plans about your benefits, prescription costs, deductibles, and make a list of your prescriptions so that you can work with a prospective plan to understand how they would transfer prescriptions as well as what the prescriptions would cost in a, a plan that you would be considering changing to. The most important way a member can prepare for open enrollment is to read the materials and review the changes for 2025. Uh, there will be important information included in the October newsletter and the HCA open enrollment web pages. Uh, that help describe the changes to the benefits and the cost changes. And remember that with some of the service area changes, primarily being some of the Peninsula counties and UMP Plus moving out of Schlan and Douglas County, there'll be those targeted communications that goes to those members to help them understand what their options are. Uh, and then we do automatically in a plan, not out of coverage if they don't act during a So there are those those extra targeted communications to Next slide, please. So once members have reviewed the changes for this year, they can change plans or waive coverage if applicable, add or drop dependents, attest to surcharges, elect FSA or limited purpose FSA or dependent care uh, program benefits, complete smart health uh, incentive, review their long-term review their life and long-term disability coverage, and designate beneficiaries. There will be a lot of helpful information and tools in our open enrollment web pages to help members with these changes. That is it for me. Any questions? Any questions for Jean? As you can see, Jean Bowie is spelled A L I S A dot R I C H A R D S at H C A dot dot com. So questions can go to Jean Bowie at Alyssa Richards at H C A dot dot com. And Alyssa can answer. I like the color coordination to the outfit and the tie. It's very nice. So you guys look good up there. On our right. land. <laughs> Other details to deal with. All right, folks, why don't we go ahead and take a 10 minute break and then we'll give Dolan to them. It is 9.52, let's call it uh, 10.05. We'll see you soon.
Yes. We can talk about swimming after. Okay. And medical bills from doing concrete. <laughs> 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 yes. All right. We uh, we live. Okay, folks, we're back. Uh, we're going to get a legislative update. Kate Walker, our policy rules and compliance section manager and the uh, Herb Division is presenting an update today of the work being done for a legislative mandated report regarding a potential PEB SEB program consolidation as materials behind tab number six. Cade, welcome. Hello. Thank you, Chair McDermott, members of the board. I'm Cade Walker, he, him pronouns. I'm a cis white male wearing glasses and a brightly colored uh, striped shirt with a bow tie. So I'm happy to be here this after, or actually this morning, to talk about the legislatively required report on consolidation. Um, so let's get hopping into this. We've got a, a few slides and uh, not too much time to cover a lot of material. So the uh, uh, this last session, the in the supplemental operating budget, the legislature asked the healthcare authority, tasked the you know the healthcare authority to write a report on uh, the potential of consolidation of the PEB and SEB programs. Now, this is um, a, 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 a topic that has been um, uh, looked at for a whole lot of years. As the next, I think the next slide will show, there's been a whole slew of reports about consolidation. In fact, 10 or more since uh, uh, the late 80s, um, with the most recent one coming in 2020. And you can see here just a brief history of all the reports that have been done about consolidation of benefit purchasing. Now, granted, the, most of these reports, except for the 2020 report, um, pertain to the consolidation of K-12 benefits purchasing. Uh, this stems back to the, the late 80s, at least the earliest one that we could find in our, our archives was reports about consolidating the K-12 benefit purchasing. Um, uh, this resulted in, uh, in 93 having an effort that was made, 1993 uh, uh, effort to try and consolidate them into a single purchasing unit. Uh, the next year that was withdrawn and, that's, um, uh, um, the, and that effort was abandoned, but all of the retirees remained in the, in, in the PEB program. That's why that legacy thing exists you know, 30 years later. Um, you can see this has been a, a longstanding topic of conversation, but this is more of a new twist of the last few years where we're looking at PEB and SEB consolidation into a single purchasing unit, not just having the K-12 um, um, purchasing consolidated because the, obviously the, the PEB purchasing has been consolidated since I think the, the 60s or maybe even earlier. So that uh, next slide, please. So let's get into a little bit of what our requirements are for this particular report. Um, this report um, for, for this year uh, asked for four primary areas to be covered in our reporting. First was to, to conceptualize a single governing board structure for the you know, consolidated program. Um, it, didn't, it didn't articulate um, anything much more than that than just having a consolidated board, um, not one board consuming the other, uh, but the creation of, of a new new governing board for the two uh, for the two programs being merged into a single program. Second, they uh, the legislature legislature asked to have a consolidation of the non Medicare risk pools. So they uh, currently, and we'll go over this a little bit more in a future slide. There's three risk pools, and they were asking us to consolidate the two risk pools for the the active non Medicare retirees. Um, uh, and what that would look like, which is a fairly easy concept, I think. Third, uh, maintaining, and this is, I think, probably the most critical and most uh, germane to those who are probably listening, uh, maintaining current eligibility for all active employees. Uh, and this is a, a crucial aspect to make sure that we're not uh, doing anything that would would change or adjust the current eligibility of the employees and the, the dependents and retirees in either the PEB or SEP program. And last, having a aligned single portfolio of benefits. Uh, this report is due to legislature this year, so it's a quick turnaround given the, the way that our reporting uh, approval process has to be done. Uh, so we're in the midst of, of getting that report first draft of it uh, done and, and uh, ready for some re internal reviewing before engaging with some external reviewing and, and having it go through our approval process through the governor's office. Um, it, it is important for us to note that the report asks for our insights and what things would look like as far as analysis goes uh, for the four requirements, but it does not ask for particular recommendations. It's not a, a lot of times reports from the, to the legislature will ask for a particular recommendation because there's not a, a, a known uh, answer to the questions they're asking. 
Uh, in this instance, this is more of a let's let's take a look at it, uh, analyze it, show us the the concepts that are in place and some options for things, um, but doesn't ask us to make any particular recommendations. Next slide, please. Additionally, the legislature included these considerations for our report drafting. One, to engage with the impacted participants. Um, this is something I think we would do anyways, but it's really great to have that additional backing of the legislature to say, we're gonna go out and engage with the impacted um, participants, both at a, a community level and at a stakeholder level to, to get their input and uh, make them aware of what it is that we've been putting together so they can have an idea about what consolidation might look like if the legislature were cho to choose to do so. Second, um, maintain again, maintaining the benefit eligibility for, for current participants. You know, they put it in both sections, I think really reiterating the importance of that concept for us in our, our um, conceptualizing of a consolidated program. Third is for us to be uh, ensuring equity in the, the work that we're doing in, in conceptualizing consolidation. And third, uh, last is to be considering the, the uh, reports that have come before, uh, probably primarily the 2020 report, which looked at consolidation of some uh, of the, the aspects of our programs, but also everything else that has come before and just taking into consideration the, uh, um, the results or the, the outcomes of those reports. Next slide, please. So we're going to dive into the four requirements of the report and, and give you a, a snapshot of where we're at so far and, and what we have been um, conceptualizing for a consolidated report. Uh, so next slide, please. So let's take a quick gander at the, the current. And uh, as the uh, um, SEV board, you're probably well aware of what your board composition is. Uh, but just for a refresher and also that we're, we're going to be using this presentation for our stakeholder engagement uh, that begins next week. Um, having this be available for everyone to take a look through. Um, on the PEP side, you can see that we have a, a eight member board um, where there is one non-voting member from the benefits management and cost containment uh, grouping of, of board members. There's a representative for state employees, a representative for state retirees, and a representative for school district retirees. Um, on the, the SEP side, the director is the chair or the director's designee is the chair. They have their four um, health benefits policy and administration with one that which is designated to be represented from an association representing school business officials or really WASPO from our what we understand it to be, uh, although that could probably change at some point in the future, but it is WASPO for the time being. Um, and then there's two board seats for um, individuals representing the interests of certificated employees and two board seats representing the interests of classified employees. And again, uh, I, I think this board has a much better appreciation of the difference between certificated and classified employees, but just for my sake in practicing this presentation, because it's the first time I've given it uh, outside of our drafting, certificated employees are all those uh, employees in the K-12 system that are employed requiring a certificate. Usually we think of those being teachers you know, requiring a teaching certificate. Um, and then the classified are the uh, the staff members that work in um, a non-certificated capacity. There's not a requirement for them to have certification for their position. And that would be uh, support services, paraeducators, uh, lunch workers, uh, groundskeepers, bus drivers, administrative staff, et cetera. All those positions that don't require a certification for that position. So, um, next slide, please. So the, the statutes, um, because one of the requirements, and I should have mentioned this earlier, and this would be a, a, Lydia, if you're listening, if you take a note to make sure I uh, we put something in there about the requirement for us drafting legislative language, uh, that would be helpful. So I'm just taking a note while I'm, I'm giving the presentation. Um, we I'm uh, listing the statutes that correlate to these different components of current requirements because the legislative uh, request was also to include language that would be used for statutory construction for a consolidated um, program. And so uh, um, looking at to where the, the board uh, authorities exist in current state statute for the PEB board that's found in the revised code of Washington section 4105055. Um, and then for the SEB board RCW 4105740. Now that is the, the, the language there for the, the composition of the boards. Um, we'll get into the board's authority here in just a minute. Um, so some of the insights we wanted to apply into a consolidated um, board composition is that the, the boards uh, uh, the boards balance equal representation of covered population and health policy representatives. And you can see that in the previous slide where there's the cost containment or the health benefit 
um, members and uh, that are equal to those who are representative of the populations that are served uh, or that are, are eligible for those benefits. Um, and then um, the, the chair, HCA's director um, or their designee serves as the chair for either board. Um, uh, so those are kind of same, same concepts that are shared between the PEB and SEB boards, even though there's a little bit of a difference in the current number and the composition, um, and that there's a non-voting board member on the PEB board uh, with its uh, current seven voting members with the PEB or SEB board having nine voting members. Uh, next slide, please. So um, we wanted to put together a, a few options for the legislature to consider of a consolidated board. Now, um, there's probably a countless number of iterations that we could we go through for this, but these are the three that we settled down on uh, in considering kind of what makes sense, looking at uh, different um, uh, boards that exist under the governor's jurisdiction um, in the state currently, seeing what numbers make sense. And so we, we narrowed it down to these three particular scenarios that we refer to as either proportional, equal, or combined. Um, proportional being representation of the board uh, based on the proportion of covered lives. Equal being that two representatives for each of the state employees, school employees, and retirees. And combined being a combined board, just kind of at the, the seven plus nine and, and what that would look like, although the math works out a little differently. I did want to include on this slide as well, you can see here the 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 large bucket populations of uh, individuals who are served through both the PEB and SEP program, bringing it down um, really based on the um, uh, um, kind of eligibility structure that they are, that individuals are eligible for either the programs, that being uh, those in the PEB program who are non-retirees, SEB, which doesn't have any retirees in it, and then the retirees themselves. And so you can see here the breakdown of the, the proportion of the um, um, covered lives in the um, three different buckets of individuals are served through our two programs. I know this is um, medical plan enrollment. If we were to include uh, enrollment in any of the benefits, because as you're aware, there's a requirement that you um, are enrolled in vision or dental, um, and you can't waive those in either program unless you're enrolled on the other side. If we include that population that doesn't have any medical coverage, that, that number, the total number actually jumps up to about 745, 750,000 uh, individuals who receive some sort of, of health benefit through either the PEB or SEB program. But for the sake of, of the medical plan, which is really the largest and probably the most impactful, that's the number we chose to use for looking at the proportionality. And you can see that it, it adjusts a little bit when we're looking at just the subscribers or we're looking at the total population subscribers and dependents. Uh, was there, I was was there, sir, one, one other update. Allison, earlier today, you asked what the eligible individuals for sub were, and I said about 148,000, and here it says 133. Those are both true numbers. Mine includes the waiver population. We have about 10% of the population that waives benefits. So this is actual enrolled. It doesn't include the population that's waived, nor those individuals. Yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't include the waived population. So I just wanted to tie those together. And going back, if we were thinking about the... 100 to 400 that have been affected, you'd actually be using that 279,000 because it would be correct of all people enrolled. Um, uh, well, when I said uh, 400 earlier, I was just talking about subscribers that didn't include any dependence on those accounts. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So the, the, I think it's where we know that in the SEB population, there's far more, there's a lot more um, waivers of the medical benefit. Um, and the numbers, like uh, what I had mentioned, that I think gets us to about 745, 750,000. Those, those are inclusive of um, those who are waiving medical, but they still have a requirement to be enrolled in um, dental and vision as those are employer paid benefits. Next slide, please. So here's the, the um, kind of composition is, uh, from those three different uh, um, consolidations, consolidated board models that we have. Now, again, remembering we're, we're not... Um, we're not merely taking the SEB population and merging it into the PEB population. These are intended to be fresh new boards that are, uh, we haven't come up with a name. Uh, we've come up with some different ideas for names. Um, some of them a little bit more serious than others, um, but we didn't, we're not, we're not making any recommendations on names for it. Uh, I'm sure when, if we get to the point where the legislature is actually putting forward some, some legislation, there'll be some options for us to input names for it, but it, it's not intended for us to say this is a 
the this is the new PEB board or this is now the PSEB board or uh, I've heard of Web being one, the Washington Employees Benefits Board. But you know, we're not putting names on anything at this point. We're just looking at the construction so that we can uh, put things down and, and, and start to get some feedback from stakeholders and, and the community. So first, we're going through the proportional representation, which would consist of 11 members in total. Uh, again, for all these boards, the, the chair would remain uh, the healthcare director, um, healthcare authorities director, or their designee as it currently exists. Um, and we would have a, an equal number of the, what we now refer to as the benefit policy and cost containment. So kind of taking some of the language from either of those um, board member types from the PEB and SEB board and kind of merging it together to get the, the new benefits policy and cost containment uh, board members, which will be the equal number for those representative of, uh, of equal number of those board members for those to those that are representative of the populations that are served by the programs. So in a proportional representation, you can see here, there'd be, uh, it's based on that population from the previous slide, which really comes down to about a, a two to two to one ratio between the PEB population, the SEB population, and then the retirees. Um, so you'd see here, we have two state employees representatives, two school employee representatives on the board, and then one retiree representative on the board for a total of 11 members. Then we have the equal representation um, on the board, which would consist of 13 members, Six being, or one being the HCA director or designee, uh, six benefits policy and cost containment members, and then two for each the state, school, and retiree populations. Uh, last would be the combined representation where we're effectively taking the current representation of the, the boards and merging them into one. Uh, it's not quite the same math. Some of you might be thinking, well, the one board has seven and well, has eight and the other board has nine. Why isn't it 17? Well, remember the, the director takes up the same position on either room, so we remove that. And we'd also remove the, the non-voting member from the, the PEB board that is um, one of the benefits cost containment members that's non-voting, leaving us with seven benefits policy and cost containment, one for state employees, one for retirees for the state, one for K-12 retirees, and then the two school employees for certificated and two classified school employee representatives for a total of 15 members total. So those are the three, three board designs that we conceptualize. Again, we're not making any, re any recommendations, um, but just having those be options that we see being uh, um, natural uh, sort of options, 11, 13, and 15 uh, members on that. Next slide, please. If there's another one. Okay, so before I get to that one, I just want to stay, say that, uh, you know, in looking at the, the board size, board sizes across the entirety of, I think the governor's office is responsible or the governor has some, jurisdiction for 260, about 260 different boards and commissions. Um, the majority of those boards, range, you know, the number of the members on each of those boards range from one member boards up through, I think there's some boards that have 43 or 44, but that's, those are significant outliers, with the majority of them falling in between a five and nine, uh, kind of at the tail end of their bell curve, you can see it's starting to hit 11 and 13. Um, so that just from a, a, a where other boards have fallen with the numbers, uh, based on the you know 260 other boards, um, we did a, a look at that and, and being a comparison um, for the numbers that we have 11, 13, or 15. Now, of course, we could look at 17 or 19 or even nine, but it seemed to make the most sense based on the, the populations that are served in current board structures and, and other similar or comparable boards that um, those numbers seem to make the most sense. So I wanna just pause there and see Dave, if there's anything else you want to add about the, the board size or see if there's any questions about the, the board composition. I was just gonna say, as we go through each of these four sections, if you, part of this is to share with you where we are on things and get your reactions and thoughts on things. So as we go through each section, uh, feel free to bring up points or insights that you wanna share uh, along this, or you can wait until the end as well. So I don't have additional points to highlight here. Um, but I'm just curious if there's any questions or reactions on this particular board structure piece of the report. I guess the one thing I will say is as the language was put in the operating supplemental operating budget, there was there were definitely a lot of stakeholder questions like, will there be representatives of employees on these boards? And hopefully the way that we are describing how we're thinking about sh uh, what the report would show as options should reassure people that we understood the exercise wasn't to eliminate representation 
of this of the populations that are served and the way that we're describing the options reinforces that they're that that understanding that th this is not about changing that fundamental structure it's about how you create a structure that involves that representation so hoping that will allay a few of the concerns that were originally um, brought up as that budget language came out Certainly not pushing for like a three member board. I mean, as easy as that might be for us on some aspects, I'm not looking at a three or even one member board, which I found it interesting that there's actually one member boards that exist because uh, I'm confused at how that would actually work, but they do exist apparently. Well, they always have quorum. <laughs> yeah, they do. Well, assuming the one board member shows up. Um, okay, moving on to our next aspect. The and this is probably the most simple one, but we'll we'll um, address this. So a single risk pool for the active and non Medicare retirees. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the current risk pools. And uh, okay, cool. I think the it does look like the uh, our citations got got corrected. So many different citations, and I, I think I goofed on some of them earlier. But this is the current risk pools that we have in, in between the PEB and SEB programs. And um, there's three. Uh, we have a a risk pool for the PEB non Medicare. Um, for PEB non-Medicare subscribers and individuals uh, that consists of the state and other employees and other employees being those employees uh, from political subdivisions, the non-represented ESDs through last year, um, the COBRA individuals from the, the PEB side of the, the, the programs, uh, those on leave without pay, et cetera, or employees or retirees and their dependents um, that fall within that definition of it's in statute. Um, it also includes the state and other non-represented Medicare retirees, as the, the asterisk and footnote um, is there, as well as the non-Medicare school retirees. And those are the those who have retired from either state or K-12, but are not yet Medicare eligible, as the name implies. They've not reached Medicare eligibility. They're in that, what we usually refer to as the active risk pool, but really it's, it's, more, uh, it's a little more accurate for us to call it the non-Medicare risk pool. Then on the, there's the PEB, um, PEB program Medicare risk pool, again, under the jurisdiction of the PEB board, which includes the state and other Medicare retirees and the Medicare eligible school retirees. So we have the, the non-Medicare risk pool on the PEB side, the Medicare risk pool on the PEB side. And then last, we have the SEB program risk pool, which consists of just those school employees. And uh, moving forward, as of this year, it would also include the um, uh, employees of political subdivisions that are permitted to participate in the the SEB program, which would be um, the associations representing school employees um, and the, the school directors and uh, um, schools that represent the uh, that are from tribal uh, tribal schools. Um, and that was a, a creation from last year, the creation of what we refer to as, as SEB um, employer groups or SEB uh, political subdivisions. So we have those current three risk pools. So in consolidating um, the two risk pools as the legislature requested, next slide, please. Real quick, Kate, before we move on to the slide, we have two corrections that we've noticed on the slide that are going to be updated. First is the, the headers above the second and third columns, those statutes are switched. 4105-0803 is really the PEP Medicare risk pool, and 4105-022 sub 3 is really the SEB risk pool. So if you just switch those two headers okay. on your page, those the statutes are a little off. And the footnote, the asterisk says, other politic other in includes political subdivisions, non-represented ESDs, COBRA, dot, dot, dot. Non-represented ESDs are actually now in the SEB risk pool as of six months ago. So just strike yeah. that from the footnote in your minds or on your little papers if you want to. So... Um, Sorry about those pieces, uh, but we'll get those updated for all our other materials. Yeah, this is one of the instances where we're because we're currently in the midst of, of drafting the report uh, and then also at the same time trying to report out to the board and stakeholder communities about the high level of where we're at and kind of the conceptions, uh, the conceptualization of the the. Um, requirements for the report, you know, we're, we're literally, you know, uh, I'm flying the plane while it's being built with this report. So uh, this is going to be a good, uh, not a dry run for us, because obviously we're, we're in the middle of presenting it, um, but allowing us to make some of those corrections as we, we see them along the way. Um, next slide, please. So uh, um, the consolidation of the, the current risk pools is described and is what the uh, requirements from the legislature are. Uh, the two risk pools that we'd be consolidating are found in RCW 4105-022 subsections two and three, 
which would ultimately result in uh, two risk pools for the consolidated program. One would be a non-Medicare risk pool, and the other would be the Medicare risk pool. So the Medicare risk pool would be maintained. There's no change to that structure. Um, and these are, aside from the accounting and the um, uh, uh, the back end work of having a, uh, no longer having two um, risk pools, it's just consolidating that uh, the, the non-Medicare risk pools into a single risk pool. Um, there, are, uh, there are no requirements from this report, and this is probably worth noting earlier in the presentation, there's, there's no requirements for um, any changes to the existing Medicare risk pool or really anything regarding Medicare, except suffice to say that um, the Medicare retirees would um, also fall under the jurisdiction of the new consolidated program and the consolidated um, board. Um, but there's no other changes that would be made to any of the existing uh, benefits for Medicare or the eligibility for Medicare or the risk pool for any of the Medicare um, population. Next slide, please. So we can see here, um, here'd be the, the kind of the, the easy visual, easier visualization of the two um, exist, the two future risk pools that would exist after a consolidation. Uh, the non-Medicare risk pool, which, which consists of the state and other employees, school employees, the state and other non-Medicare retirees, and the non-Medicare school retirees. Then the other risk pool would remain uh, without any uh, uh, changes to it would be the Medicare risk pool consisting of the Medicare retirees from both the state, um, other individuals, uh, which would be the, the um, uh, retirees from uh, Medicare retirees from uh, uh, political subdivisions and other other of uh, those um, group that were listed earlier, and then the uh, school retirees who are Medicare eligible as well. Uh, let's see, I don't think there's anything after this slide, but next slide, please. All right, so just pausing briefly to see if there's any questions about the, the risk pools consolidations. So this part of the presentation is describing the what. I do want to reassure the board that there will be some financial insights about the impacts of combining pools. It's just that's still being worked on. We wanted to make sure people understood what that prong is really about and what it represents. But there will be fiscal insights in the ultimate report. Thank you, Dave. All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about how the consolidated program would maintain eligibility for all the active employees. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, eligibility. Well, there is a whole lot of, of stuff about eligibility in statutes. Um, the, the, as we as we be kind of looking through all the different iterations uh, and requirements for eligibility, it really came down to uh, three groups of populations that we we made. First being um, all of the the PEB program employees. This would be uh, inclusive of the employees of the state the elected and appointed officials of the executive branch, justices of the Supreme Court and judges of the Court of Appeals and Superior Court, members of the state legislature and employees of employer groups. And again, remember the employer groups are political subdivisions, cities, counties, municipalities, uh, used to contain school uh, school districts, but now that the sub programs there, that definition uh, was amended. Uh, it has a whole slew of other um, employee types that are listed under statute that have been defined and um, because they are included in the definition of a, a PEB program employee, they are eligible to participate. Um, most, But all the employees of employer groups, those are eligible to participate by uh, um, consent and contract with the program and not required to participate. It's a little bit of a nuance. Um, and that more of that can be found in the definition that's listed there, RCW 4105 011 six uh, sub six sub a is that definition that goes through um, those those current um, um, listed employees then uh, the said program a little bit easier definition includes all the employees of school districts educational service districts uh, bsds uh, charter schools and the employees of said program employer groups again that's the uh, uh, groups representing um, um, so groups associations that represent school employees um, the employees of tribal school districts, and um, that can also include um, school school board directors. And the last bucket would be those who are the, the retired, disabled, or separated employees, um, which would include all of the, the K-12 and state retirees, the retirees of employer groups that are permitted to participate in, in retiree, uh, those who are disabled or otherwise separated employees has a little bit of a funny definition. Um, um, it has a 
it separate employees. If you go look at the definition under 4105011, I think it's, oh, I'm not going to guess what it is, but it those are the employees who have um, left state or K-12 service who are enrolled in a particular retirement plan, plan two or plan three with DRS, um, but are not yet Medicare eligible. And those are typically going to be the employees who are um, or former employees who are not yet in the retired status and drawing a pension, um, but are permitted to um, get benefits through the PEB program um, until you know they they would be those employees who are in the uh, non Medicare risk pool because these separate employees are not yet Medicare eligible. So a little bit of trickiness on the definitions, but this is our our best effort to try and um, um, create some structure that we can then have a consolidated list of eligibility that can be uh, um, um, main that would maintain all of the eligibility structures that currently exist in either program. So next slide, please. Um, going through a little bit more on some of the specifics of eligibility requirements. Um, the PEB program has a far more extensive list of requirements. I think that's because of the population that are served in looking at different populations like state employees, higher ed employees, um, some of the differences in the employee types. Um, you can see here the statutory reference um, of 4105.065 uh, sub 4, and it has A through K have different eligibility requirements and thresholds that the board is required to um, not have be any more restrictive than what is listed in statute. So it, the statute sets kind of the, the floor for eligibility, and then the board has the, the option to provide greater eligibility as provided for, but it cannot, um, it cannot uh, um, create eligibility that is that ex goes below that floor that's set by statute. Um, and all of the requirements, the rules for those um, are contained in the Washington Administrative Code 182-12, um, and there's extensive rules pertaining to all the eligibility um, for the um, uh, populations that are eligible under for the PEB program. The SEB program's uh, a little bit more easy uh, because I'd, I'd say it probably hasn't had enough time to develop as much as the PEB program has. Its requirements for the, the floor for eligibility is found in RCW 4105, 740, um, subsection D and E. D is where most of the active population is, uh, the eligibility is found for. That's where the 630 rule comes into play. Um, and E is, is a permissive um, um, eligibility for, for school districts to be able to bargain for um, enhanced eligibility uh, with some requirements there. And its um, correlative administrative rules is found in, in WAC 18231. And the last grouping of eligibility is for those who are um, retired, disabled, or separated employees from the state or K-12 or other um, employer groups. And that eligibility is found in RCW 4105-080. Um, it's notable that, that that statute, while it's not the PEB board's um, authority statute, which is 4105-065, um, this particular um, statute does give reference that under the terms and conditions set by the PEB board, these populations are eligible for, for um, continuing benefits in the PEB program. Um, that's where that authority comes from. And its um, rules pertaining to those eligibility is also found in, in um, WAC 182-12. Um, and integrated in that, that section as well. So next slide, please. So eligibility complicated. Uh, there's a lot of complications that go to it, but um, the nice thing is consolidating it um, is not nearly as complicated as one might think. Um, what we've tried to do is combine, you know, have the structure of the three different categories of eligibility statute and WAX that would be combined um, and differentiating them um, just to keep it nice and clean and making sure that there's there's not a um, crossover of different eligibilities to different populations that they weren't intended to be applied to. Um, we don't want to have the 630 rule for the, the SEB population be applied to anyone in the, the population identified for PEB employees or any of the, you know, perhaps the eight hour maintenance rule or the, the 80 hour eligibility rules from the PEB program being applied to the SEB population because that would again be a change in eligibility, which the legislative requirements say don't do that. So um, keeping them bucketed together where we can identify that population, we can identify um, statutorily and having the definition of what a PEB employee is, or really, sorry, let me phrase that, what state employees are. We'd have a refresh definition um, going from what currently in statute is just referred to as employees, we would now um, consider to be state employees. And when we refer to state employees, we're referring to all employees of the state 
the elected and appointed officials of the executive branch, um, justices of the Supreme Court, members of the Court of Appeals and Superior Courts, and members of the state legislature. Um, so carrying forward the, the definition of employees uh, with a carve out of parts of the that definition that pertain to those who participate by contract. And these are just the state employees who are required to participate um, in the current PEB program, we would now be referring to as state employees. Um, and just as a note, the employees of state, that includes all of agencies, um, executive branch agencies and agencies of the state and higher education, um, all of the, the state institutions, University of Washington, WSU, uh, Western, Eastern, Evergreen, et cetera, and all the um, community and technical colleges as well. Then we would have a, uh, we maintain the definition that's there, but we would re re bring that forward for school employees. Um, school employees would be including the employees of school districts, uh, educational service districts, and charter schools. So that's currently is defined separately in the statute, and we'd carry that forward into a consolidated eligibility framework. And then last, next slide, please. And certainly not least, we would what we consider the other eligible subscribers or, or the those who are under optional participation. Um, and that's going to include the separate employees, as I kind of explained earlier, those who are non-Medicare, but have separated from either K-12 or state employment, who are enrolled in um, a, a Department of Retirement Services Plan 2 or 3. Um, that was something that changed recently, including Plan um, 2 members in there. Um, so all the separate employees. The retired or disabled public school employees and their dependents, the surviving dependents of public and school employees, the surviving dependents of emergency personnel killed in the line of duty, formally elected or appointed officials and legislators, school board members, employer groups, and retired employees from formerly participating employer groups. Now, this encapsulates all the entirety of the rest of the population of which there is eligibility. Um, for participation in the, the PEB program currently and the SEB program uh, as it pertains to the, the um, um, employer groups. And so this would be uh, those that group of, of individuals and subscribers and their dependents that, uh, for, for lack of any better term, have the option of being able to participate in PEB or SEB um, by you know, choosing to participate or not. You know, retirees, they can choose to participate in the program or not. If they want to go do their own um, coverage, that's fine. Uh, they can go do it. They'll, you know, they do because we offer such fine benefits. You know, the vast majority of them do um, have their benefits through us. But it also includes all the other categories of, of employees that are found throughout statute, particularly 4105080, which are those that are the, the surviving dependents of employees um, with the requirements and, and eligibility requirements exist there. Uh, the dependents for emergency personnel, um, former elected and appointed officials, uh, school board members, that's actually found in, in a different statute, 4105-742, I believe, is where that's found. Um, so we're taking all those other eligibility um, requirements and consolidating them into this group of other eligible subscribers um, that have that optional participation. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we'll talk about real quickly about what would not change. Um, the current eligibility specific to state and school employees would continue to apply to those specific employee categories under the consolidation. That's why we've created those, those categories, three categories. It makes it easy for us to be able to maintain and, and pull forward the existing um, eligibility and put that into a, a little bit of a new framework under a single consolidated board. Um, so some examples that would that we're, we want to just call out um, the hours requirement requirements unique to each category type for the, the um, non-Medicare population for the state employees and the school employees, the eligibility determinations that would uh, um, occur at the start of each school year would continue to apply only for school board, only for school employees. Um, the eight hour maintenance rules I mentioned before would only apply to those a subset of state employees. Um, faculty averaging would continue to apply only to higher education institutions, um, which would be part of the state employee category. Seasonal worker eligibility would continue to only apply to a subset of state employees as well. So you can see uh, the reason for us creating these categories allows us to, to maintain the, the eligibility without having that crossover potential uh, if we were just to put all the eligibility rules, just squish them all together without some sort of framework uh, defining the, the category of individuals who are, are um, um, eligible, th those eligibility requirements apply to. Uh, I think that's the next, next slide, please. 
All right, that's it. So I did want to just pause there at the end of that section. Dave, is there anything you'd like to add and we're uh, opening up for some questions on that? One thing, um, you know, to drive home the point about the, the prior slide, you know, if I asked, if I pop quizzed you, sorry, I, can I pop quiz the teacher? Um, if I pop quizzed you and said, <laughs> what is the bread and butter eligibility for SEB? Most of you would say 630 hours in a school year. If I asked your PEP counterparts that, it's a bit more complicated, but most of them would hopefully say anticipated to work 80 hours for six months and then to maintain benefits eligibility, eight hours pay status each month thereafter. A lot That's a lot more words, but that is the bread and butter of PEP. And so those 80 hours plus eight hour maintenance rule compared to 630 hours, it's not the same decimal FTE status. They're both in the point four to point five range, but they are not actually identical when you get down to like FTE hours. And so one of the questions that some stakeholders ask is, well, by consolidating, are you consolidating eligibility that one of the programs loses some of their eligibility? And so we we're trying to reinforce with this slide 20 is, nope, those bread and butter pieces stay the same. And our goal would be to create the statutes or advise on how to write the statutes and rules to make sure that the existing rules that apply to certain populations continue to apply only to those populations and things aren't incorrectly imported to a different type of employee status and something isn't lost by any employee status. So. Well, I think that you're pop quizzing the teacher to understand that um, the role of an educator versus the role of a state employee, it is a different, we, we think in different, you know, as an educator, I work in days. Um, my counterpart over here works in hours. Um, but a state employee will work so many hours per week. So it's a different, just to keep that in mind as you go there across the conference. Yeah, absolutely. And we also appreciate that the when we're looking at the the what constitutes a, a single FTE in the state employee side, that is typically going to be a, a 20, 80 um, year, uh, uh, hours per year, uh, it constitutes a, a um, single FT, you know, 50, 40 hours a week for 52 weeks a year. Um, in K-12, we recognize that there's uh, some different measurements, whether it's 13, 20, or 14, 40 uh, for the hours that constitute a, a 1.0 FTE on the school employee side, let alone the way they calculate that or think in terms of days or, or hours or um, FTE status. I, um, so that's why, you know, recognizing that and trying to keep the framework as clear as possible to help assure that we're not um, changing up anything, making it worse or better unintentionally, but maintaining it as the requirement from the legislature um, was very clearly spelled out in two different parts of that requirement. And that's really the point that we're driving home here is we see this as how would we advise writing a single statute and set of rules cohesively to maintain current eligibility rules and not increase or decrease any of the eligibility. So it's, it's really the in some ways, an administrative task of how do you write all of what is currently in multiple places in statute and rule into a single cohesive set without actually changing substantively. So that's what we understand and are, are describing and into the framework for this part of the report. I'll say that question. Any other questions for now? We can go to the last part, Kate. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, and this and this isn't uh, you know there there of course is there a possibility of other um, eligibility changes. I know there's been a lot of conversation about retiree rehires and things like we're we're not addressing any of those issues with this. That this is just the report that's asking us to maintain everything. Um, of course, the legislature could always add uh, add changes into it, it you know as um, they seem fit. But for the report purposes of this report, it's just maintaining how to make sure that there's not any um, inadvertent uh, increase or really making sure there's no decrease in eligibility for any of the populations that currently exist. So the last section we have is single portfolio of benefits. I'm gonna try and cruise through this a little bit faster. I know I'm um, probably going over. So um, the current benefits portfolio, uh, a lot of similarities in structure, um, but there are just some differences. We wanna make sure we're calling out for those to, you know, everyone to be aware. Uh, primarily looking at the, Differences in the medical side um, on the PEB uh, versus the SEB, you can see there's the three carriers in the PEB program for the non-Medicare population, as opposed to the five carriers. Uh, there's 10 plans available uh, um, uh, for the PEB program, not all available to everyone in every county. Um, um, and same for the SEB program. Well, there's 17 plans, not all of them are available to everyone in every county. 
Um, but that is, there is some differences in the, the, the carriers, the number of carriers and the number of plans that are available in the programs. Uh, dental does, dental has um, um, the, at least the plan numbers and the plans uh, available are the same, even though there are some differences we'll go over in a minute. Uh, vision is identical between the two programs as of 2025. Uh, currently, there's differences, but we're kind of being a little forward thinking for the report because consolidation wouldn't happen uh, uh, before the the PEP side has their vision carve out for 2025, and those plans are identical to the SEP program, leveraging those current contracts. The uh, life in AD and D is essentially the same uh, for the two programs, um, as is the LTD, even though the benefit itself is a little different on the employer paid and the cost for it. But the overall structure and the carriers for, for life, AD and D and LTD are the same between the two programs. Next slide, please. Um, so we see here just some differences in the premiums I want to note, um, or at least some, some of the, the, the cost aspects that are different. On the PEP side, uh, we have employee premiums of the plans range from $26 for an individual or $72 for full family, up to $331 or $910 um, for the, the employee portion of the premium. On the SEB program side, we have $21 or $63 um, at the low end, and at the high end is $237 or $711. And again, those splits are um, for an individual, the employee's portion for individual coverage versus full family coverage. The deductibles, and I so apologize, this is for medical plans only. So the deductibles range from $125 and $375 um, up to $1,600 or $3,200, um, which is the same on the, the SEB side. You can see that the out-of-pocket maximum is uh, pretty similar, but because of one of the plans that's available on the PEB side, um, it's out-of-pocket maximum is just a little higher on the high end as opposed to the SEB program's um, high end of its, if it's uh, out-of-pocket maximum. And the co-insurance um, range is a little bit different. Uh, the low end for the PEB program is from 10 up to 20%, and the SEB program with one of their plans having a 30% um, co-insurance for one of their, I believe it's one of their high deductible plans that has a co-insurance up to that point. Uh, next, I, actually, I retract that. I don't think that's what it is, but uh, um, I'll get back to, I'll find out what that is. It's it's not as relevant for the conversation that we're having though. Next slide, please. Um, another quick skip slide 24, because it's actually duplicative of 22 and meant to be removed. So go to 25. Yep, 25. All right. So um, here's just a couple of the, the current differences on the dental program. Uh, for PEB and SEB, the Delta Care and the Willamette plans, and Delta Care, remember, is, is not the uniform dental. It's administered by Delta Dental, but it's not the Delta Dental um, uniform dental plan administered by Delta Dental. But the Delta Care and Willamette uh, plans are identical for both the PEB and SEB programs as far as what the benefit is that's offered. There is a difference on the uniform dental plan. In the SEB program, there's waived deductible for children up to age 15. There's increased plan coverage for crowns, uh, posterior teeth composite fillings, and an increased benefit for non-surgical treatment of temporomandibular joint, um, or TMJ. Um, that was something that resulted from collective, or uh, uh, funding that, that resulted in differences from collective bargaining um, um, two years ago. The vision plans are identical as previously stated. The life insurance and AD&D &D are identical. Um, and then the long-term disability, the, the difference between the two programs is uh, benefit for the long-term disability or LTD is that while the optional supplemental coverage is, play, is paid um, is the same for both programs, there's a difference in the, the maximum benefit for the employer portion of the benefit. Uh, the PEB program's maximum benefit is $240 monthly maximum benefit, and the SEP program is a $400 monthly maximum benefit, and that's for the employer portion of the employer paid benefit for LTD um, and the difference being just the, some of the, the risk score for the populations or really what the the same amount of the, the money put into that benefit was able to um, provide um, for that employer paid benefit. Next slide, please. So um, really what the, the real crux is, is looking at what a consolidated benefits portfolio would look like. Um, okay, so real quick, we have a question from Donna. Shoot. Hey, in the dental, we have the different options. Does consolidating the board and the premiums, does that eliminate our bargaining? No, there's nothing about collective bargaining envisioned that changes uh, or asked dental. in the report. Not dental. Like I said, we collectively bargained to have those extra things. If it's a combined board, do we lose that collective bargaining option for the future? A couple of clarifications. 
the, there was funding that was bargaining, bargaining collectively that resulted in these changes. Just to, it, it is an important nuance that the benefit design itself wasn't collectively a bargain. The dollar um, and additional investment was what was bargained and the way the state complied with the collective bargaining agreement was through these benefit enhancements. But there were other options that could have been done to fulfill the dollar that was bargained. But um, that then gets built into the kind of the base rate of uh, ongoing claims expenses. And so the, I'm not sure, I'm not sure exactly the best way to answer your question, Donna, but this is a difference that has to be addressed at one point. Um, what I would say is there are a lot of clinical bases that were part of the reason that these were picked up in SEB and the argument will be made that those same clinical reasons for having some of these enhancements should be the future state of the benefit. It's just whether there's going to be funding in the PEP program for that. And I, I think it's fair to say it's going to complicate bargaining. Yeah. It just is. That's a good way to put it, yeah. It's just, it just is. You know, and how they're going to address that and how uh, one at one bargaining table, they're going to ask for X, Y, Z at another yeah. ABC and how they're going to administer that is going to be complicated. Does I mean, that need to be in this report anywhere, though? The, which the, part? The, the comments the, about collective bargaining? Yeah. Uh, we can look at that, especially yeah. in the context of where you bring up. We, we were trying to make sure that there, there, I mean, people have acknowledged that there are two separate bargaining tables, and this report doesn't ask the agency to analyze or look at or give any insights related to the existence of two bargaining tables under a potential future singular program. And since but, the legislature approves those packages, they are aware, but I don't think it would be bad just to at least mention that least aspect mention. of it. Yeah. Because if you go back to the 2020 legislative report, the, the most recent one, there was a list of a variety of things that, you know, depending on what you mean by consolidated, you mean full consolidation, it includes these 25 things. If, but you could also say, you know, we mean consolidation without doing all 25 of those things. And one of the things yeah. is, you know, should, you know, collective bargaining, there's two tables. If you wanted to have a singular program, you, one could say full consolidation includes a singular table. But the legislature didn't ask us to look at the collective bargaining process. But I think what you're highlighting is here in the benefits portfolio side of the equation, highlighting that some of the investments and that distinguished benefit design have resulted from collective bargaining and that there are separate teams for that. So I think we can look at how to kind of account for that. And Dave, I might be getting way out there, but they could account for some of those dollars in the premium that's paid by the employee. They could modify the premium that's paid to account for the extra dollars. Because like they've said, it's not that they negotiated that benefit, they negotiated money. And so there might be other ways to infuse money uh, to take into consideration the collective bargaining. To make sure that the total amount that was invested and is agreed to continues to be invested, even if it's a different plan. So yeah, there's the, we we um, the collective bargaining issue has been something we have been been thinking through, and the there wouldn't the anticipation of not having it being consolidated, you know, not roping it into that, you know, that's not anything we've been addressing. You know, one of the aspects I think what Lou was sort of getting at is the potential for there to be um, some employee premium differences between you know, the state and school employee populations that we've identified. You know, we are keeping eligibility parsed out between them. Um, it's you know, possible that there would be differences in the employee premiums for the medical, because those are that aside from the supplemental benefits that are, that are uh, uh, optional for employees to, to um, enroll in, um, the only other um, benefit that they contribute to is the medical premium. And there could be potentially um, different medical premiums for the employee uh, portion that would be different for the state employee population or the school employee population, it's possible. Um, it's not something that you know, we've gone into, but that's certainly something that could exist where there's still kind of recognition of the amounts that are bargained for by each respective bargaining um, bargaining unit um, that could then have an impact on the what the employee pays um, with the same for the same benefits. Um, that would still be under the, the same cost, uh, depending on how bargaining would go. Um, things that we we have kind of contemplated, but again, it's a little 
uh, not specifically what was asked for by the legislature, but we're also recognizing that if the intent is for consolidation, we want to make sure that we're, we're being as comprehensive as possible and the, the potential um, impacts that consolidation would have on, on the, the process from starting to finishing um, from all the point from bargaining and, and benefit procurement all the way through to where the, um, the, the services that employees are paying for and receiving. So as we look at the anticipated benefits of a single non-Medicare portfolio, um, the contracts, current contracts for the medical benefit can be better leveraged for services covering both populations. These are some of the, the upside, I think, of having that single portfolio. Um, the single portfolio of medical plans, um, allowing us that, that more leveraging um, with those contracted for the populations and increased availability of plans throughout the state. You know, that's something we have heard of on from either the programs, some of the availability and options for, for plans that are available, being able to enhance that, um, you know, with additional carriers and different plan options that would be available to uh, the consolidated populations of school and state employees. Uh, the single portfolio, uh, for example, um, there'd be one set of, of uniform dental plans, uh, one set of UMP and Kaiser Primera, uh, create some administrative simplifications um, and being able to then enhance, you know, bring those benefits up to uh, parallel structures and what the benefit designs are. And, and then some additional uh, uh, financial insights. Um, and Dave, I, I, I'm going to defer to you a little bit on the, or if Tani was there, but the employer medical contribution or the EMC um, and, and some of the tier ratio alignments between the, the full family and individual tiers and, and the breakdowns of those. Dave, I want to, to, um, defer to you on some of those financial insights. Yeah, so and really the theme of this part of the report is to catalog some of the major differences and catalog where there are not differences to really kind of highlight um, you know, highlight how similar or different various parts of the portfolio are. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of things that are very similar. Um, and then ultimately these differences are things that would have to be addressed in a consolidation. So we're seeing a lot of this as not what should the end result be? Because again, we're supposed to give insights and analysis, not recommendations. And we're taking this part of the report as cataloging kind of where there are major variances between the two programs. When it comes to the financial insights, you know, there's some of this ties back to the insights that will be provided on the risk pool analysis, because by taking two risk pools and putting them together and then singularly rating those risk pools, the anticipated outcome would be the same employee premium regardless of whether you're a superintendent or a uh, uh, seasonal worker at the Department of Ecology, uh, that the, the premium would be the same across the entirety of the 700,000, 700,000 population. And so there are implications to describe how the calculation is done whenever you're doing those risk pools. So the, but there are, that, that, that includes describing potential impacts to the EMC process. So that's what, where there'll be some financial insights. The tier ratio pieces, I think this board is well aware that there's a three to one ratio within the SEP program. On the PEP program side right now, that ratio is one to 2.75. So if there's a singular program, you have to have a singular tier ratio structure. So that would be something else that has to be addressed. So again, this is examples of some of the things that we are high level acknowledgements of cataloging those differences. Right now, the EMC methodology is identical. Well, except it's different. The, the way it's done is identical, but each program has a different benchmark plan, but they are similar, but not identical benchmark plans. So that's where there's another kind of little nuance too. But it is, even though it feels like it's a small one because it's the core structure of the state's obligation for payment of benefits, it is an important piece that will need to be described. Back to you, Kate. Thank you. And then the last slide on this section. Uh, again, reiterating, there's no changes to the existing Medicare portfolio. While it would be uh, that portfolio would now be under the jurisdiction of the new consolidated board, uh, there would be no anticipated changes, no anticipated because there wouldn't be any changes to it. We just carry forward um, the existing Medicare portfolio into that new consolidated program. Um, lastly, some of the member impacts. You know, it is really difficult to say, um, not knowing the specific plan designs uh, that would exist for a single um, single portfolio. You know, there are some differences in the plan designs uh, in the some of the benefits. You know, there's some uh, differences in the, the number of PTST OT visits between some of the plans and, and the programs. And so it would really come down to what does the consolidated board approve for that plan design moving forward for the, the plan year in which those plans would become effective or available for enrollment. And um, then lastly, in generally speaking, when we look at some of the, the, the relative risk between the two 
um, um, school and state employee populations uh, is that we would anticipate that members, if everything being the same carried forward, that they would experience about a 1% variation in premiums based on those current differences in the relative risk scores for the, the PEB and SEB um, um, non-Medicare risk pools that exist. So we know there'd be some variation there and that would be 1% on the total premium, uh, which the employee portion of it being you know, approximately 15%. Uh, depending on which plan you're in, you know that, that fractionated one percent difference into that that change. So not not anticipating you know, all things being the same, uh, very uh, negligible financial impact changes for the members and negligible impacts on plan design, just depending on what the consolidated board would approve for the plan designs moving forward for a consolidated program. Uh, that is the end of this. On that last part, that's really just your preview of coming attractions. That, relatively speaking. The non-Medicare risk pool in PEB and the active, non, also called non-Medicare risk pool in SEB, are relatively similar in risk profile. Thank you, Dave. So pause there to see if there's any questions about the um, consolidated, any additional questions about the consolidated portfolio. Okay, moving on, uh, we're just going to kind of start wrapping things up. And the... One of the last requirements is for us to be engaged with stakeholder and community members to understand the, the impacts that the consolidated program would have. Uh, so next slide, please. Um, our efforts that we are undertaking for engaging with stakeholders and getting feedback, um, first and foremost is this meeting here today and the meeting with the PEB board tomorrow, where we are soliciting feedback from you all as board members, uh, your initial thoughts um, about uh, the, the plan, uh, the, the framework that we have presented here today for a consolidated program. Um, and then we are beginning next week, we are engaging with a, a broad array of stakeholders from both the PEB and SEB programs um, that will occur for the next month. Um, we, are, we have a general information meeting with a large group of, of stakeholders scheduled for July 18th or a week from tomorrow. Um, and then we are leveraging existing stakeholder meetings to, to collect further information and, and present you know, this same presentation to them with some of our, our uh, corrections and updates that we'll be making. Um, and then we are asking for anyone that's wanting to provide written feedback. Uh, we're, not planning, we're not planning on taking uh, much of the feedback from these, the, the stakeholder engagements beginning next week. Uh, it's more informational and being able to uh, offer questions and answers. Um, but we are asking for written feedback to be due back to us and back to me by August 16th so that we can then uh, use that in consideration of finalizing our draft of the report before we have to have it uh, into our approval process in uh, the first part of September when it has to begin its approval process, having a, a full final draft or a full draft um, that goes through the rounds for reviews and, um, and editing and to the, the likes. Next slide, please. So um, here, I want to just open it up again for any further discussion. Uh, again, asking for specific discussion on these four aspects of consolidation of our pro of the two programs. Again, the single governing board structure, a single risk pool for the active and non-Medicare retirees, while also maintaining the risk pool for Medicare retirees, uh, maintaining the current eligibility and that framework that we've presented uh, for state employees, school employees, and the other subscribers. Um, uh, that are non-mandatory uh, participants, and then the the uh, single portfolio of benefits. And with that, uh, next slide, please. You know, our final reminder is again, uh, we're asking for written feedback by the 16th, and our report is due the first. So with that, um, I will want to turn it over to Dave for discussion about um, our consolidation um, structure so far. I know Pam had some things, so <laughs> maybe just put slide 20. Nine or 30 back up on the slide, just that's the structure. All right, so I, I'm with this legislation that came forward. When you looked at the legislative intent, what was what were they trying to accomplish? Is it they want to have a single governing board? I'm trying to understand this. So, um, specific to the governing board, or you know, why, why, why did the legislature put forward this? to ask for the report, you know, tasking is like being told and told, you know, yeah. is there intent? Yes, we want to put SEB and PEB together. So, you know, what what was behind the legislation that says, we want to do this because, what was the because? Okay, the, the genesis of the this actual report language in the operating budget started with some community stakeholders, actually. Um, 
stepping back, you know, there's education policy, there's health policy. And one of the jokes I made is, you know, the only thing harder than K-12 policy is K-12 and health policy at the same time. <laughs> um, and so from a, if you step back and look at a health policy perspective, there's a fair amount of community engagement and, uh, and interest in changing how health insurance works in our state and country. Um, and there's yes. quite a, a robust discussion on that point in our everyday kind of state society. And, you know, this agency has a variety of different roles in helping support the legislature understand what a future, sub, uh, it's very hard to use words because the words are to mean different things to different people, but I always say, you know, there's something on the single payer universal side of the equation, and here we are on this side of the equation more in an employer-sponsored world. So any movement into, you know, uh, to this side of the equation, you know, some people want a light switch and just magically move from one side to the other very quickly. And that is going to be, be a very hard task. Other yeah. people's policy perspective is incremental changes that could lead towards something on the other side of the spectrum. And many people see consolidating government programs, all of them, in an incremental fashion can help set the stage for infrastructure for something that changes the system overall. And so some of the health advocates that are interested in moving health policy in that direction picked up the idea of, well, let's have more consolidation of government programs into a singular program and ask and lobby for a report to talk about what could be the next incremental steps for that type of consolidation. So that's the, the literal true genesis of this particular report that came forward. Um, and at the, the same time, um, there are, you know, legislative intent is very hard because there's 147 legislators and how, you know, lots of compromises made in, in everything in the legislature. I, there are certainly some parts of the legislature who are very interested in see administrative simplification and, you know, they have constituents that ask them and then, then they ask us, why do they have more plans available in SEP than they do in PEB? And why is it this? Why is that different here? And, you know, you know some people look at it from an equity lens. You know, why why is there better crown coverage in, in SEP than PEB? Like one was funded and one wasn't. Why is there better vision coverage in employment sponsored insurance instead of Medicaid? It's a great question to send back to that very debate. And so th there's a whole lot of different angles in there, but that's really, you know, it, the genesis. And also, if you look back at the reports that go back to the 80s, you know, one of the grand questions was, for all of the reports prior to 2020 was, if K-12 is going to be consolidated, how? And for almost universally all of those reports, the recommendation, which was asked for from the agency in all those reports, was consolidate into a single program instead of a separate program. And then in 2017, the legislature created a separate program. And now they've asked, well, what if we had made a single program? Um, and so, so here we are trying to answer that question. Because there are definitely folks, some folks in the legislature who are, who are interested and think it makes sense to have a singular program for all public sector employees instead of something that's different. Is that helpful? Absolutely. That, that's what I thought it was going to be, but I wanted to make sure. So I, I remember back when I was lobbying that... Um, you know, there was talk of combining, well, we didn't have sub at that point, but joint of educators joining PEB. And if we did that, it would implode because it would have been too, too many all at once too fast. If we, if this moves forward into a single thing, what is the timeline to do it well so that we don't implode? I think a good proxy for that is the 2020 report. The 2020 report um, budget language that directed that consolidation report did have a targeted deadline for consolidation. Um, and the way that uh, the agency responded to that report was, well, it depends on what you mean by consolidation. If you mean everything yeah. in every iteration, it can't be done by the timeline that you asked. And the way we answered the question was, here is the multi-year stage of the pieces that have to be sequenced in order to get to wherever you want to pick on the choose your own adventure book of consolidation. And if you want everything and anything, here's the timeline. And I believe the timeline for 20, the 2020 report had assumed a consolidation by 2020, January, 2023. And we actually described a process that would have taken until at least through 2025. Okay. Some of the things that were done and are talked about in that 2020 report have since been done. Okay. Um, and so it's not that it's always a five-year plan, but there is a sequence of events because you have to, talk about what has changed legislatively, if it impacts collective bargaining, 
when collective bargaining comes into place and whether you're reopening bargaining if it implicates that. So there is this multi-year approach. Um, but our our task this time didn't include a deadline and doesn't have a timeline piece that is associated with it. I, I, I would direct people to the 2020 report to see the type of sequencing that needs to be accounted for in that. Um, and to your first comment was kind of about moving too far too fast, putting directly in a bed. It just would have been different. I think Alice, Al, Terry, has Terry joined? Terry did. So Alice, you're the only one besides Lou and staff that were here for all of it. It just would have been a very different type of work in that two and a half years. Um, I don't know that it would have been easier or harder in some ways that, that there would have been parts of it that were easier and parts of it that were harder. All the eligibility framework would still have to been created. Would we have had an agency have to done three simultaneous procurements for benefits? Probably not. Um, and that would have made some of that work easier and some of the benefit conversations a little would have just been different. So I don't know that it's, I don't, I, I personally wouldn't have said it, it would be, it would have been necessarily inherently harder or would have imploded. It just would have been, it would have been different. Um, but it was also the way the agency had thought if K-12 consolidation was ever going to happen, that it probably would have happened. Um, and so we had to pivot to creating a separate program instead because that's what the legislature decided to place. I think one of the interesting things about about this concept is that the providers are all the same. Right. I mean, with the exception of KP, you know, yeah, we're yeah. going to let that go, but the providers are the same. It's the carriers and it's how, who's getting what money for what and how. Yeah. And so if you're the provider and you only want to take a certain insurance um, and then this change has happened and your whole panel just dried up, so then you need to take different insurance. So, I mean, everything sort of adjusts to account for it. But at the end of the day, there's still a certain number of providers out there. There's a certain number of humans, and these humans are receiving services through different mechanisms. And the trick is to streamline those mechanisms, to make it easier for people to understand it, to streamline it, to fund it, to do all those things. But anytime you combine something, there's... There's angst. There's oh, yeah. perceived winners and losers, even if they aren't winners and losers on the grand scheme when you look at it. Well, yeah, your benefit went down a little, but your premiums went down as well. And so you're actually capturing that money there. But that's really hard to explain to people, and it takes time. And so yeah. hopefully if the legislature says do something, it gives us adequate time to do a communications yes. plan to get our system squared away and to get everybody sort of ready for it. And uh, kind, of like, kind of like we did when we all joined SEP, it, it was, there was angst. There was we, a lot of angst. But we survived it. But yeah. it was, a, it was, I would say, barely enough runway to make it happen. Yeah. I would say barely. I'd say it was the, per, my opinion is it was the perfect amount of <laughs> runway because longer could have been harder too. It was, it, yeah. there, there was risk in a two and a half year timeline and there would have been different and I think possibly harder risk. For a four and a half year timeline, sure. you have to think of it biennial terms. Essentially. Yes. Yes. Does this moving to I'll call it the single whatever it is? Does that save HCA money? A, a single consolidation. Does it cover a board consolidation. Okay. The entire. The, yeah. Okay. I want to make sure people focus on one part. Yeah. Um, or does it streamline it because you're not doing two meetings a week? Um, it's not just about two meetings a week. I mean, because okay. but but. There is a piece of there are some administrative duplication. Okay. Um, you know, we have for UMP, we have 10 COCs because we've made a decision at one point. It's like we're not going to put a singular COC that says if you're a school employee, you have 80 PTS DOT business. But if you're a state employee, it's 60 because then that just three picks at that every time somebody looks at the COC. So we have, you know, we produce a 200 page document twice. Yeah. for a couple of minor differences. And so we'd be able to save on some of that communication piece, uh, for example. Uh, you know, I don't, we, we spend, I'm just going to make it up, let's say we have eight hour eight hours of board meetings every two weeks for the Pep and Set. In a combined world, it'd probably be more like six. It's not going to be a complete elimination right. of that, but there would be some administrative savings to that. Now, whether that is enough that can be booked by the legislature, probably not. Um, and when you're talking about consolidating the risk pools, you're not changing the total $5 billion that's needed. You're just mapping it differently. So there's not inherently a large savings that's expected by consolidating the risk pools. You're just 
it's just x plus y equals 5 billion and x and y are different variables in a singular equation instead of x plus y plus a plus b. But I think it will impact procurement. Yeah. But yes. Procurements will be impacted by consolidation. We will have more purchasing power. Right. We will be able to uh, leverage that and get better deals, better service for the people we serve. So there, there will be downstream effects. You won't see them on day one, though. No. It's going to take time. And I would say one of the, it's, it's, it seems small, but it, it drives so many conversations every day. And those minor differences that have to be remembered every day in every conversation, in every communication. It's like the exception to the exception to the exception and the difference between the program. It, it's just, you know, it's five minutes every, every hour times 10 people. You know, there is that sunk cost from just having to re-engage on those differences that are just enough that they have to be described because they are unique to each program that would be eliminated because the answer is the same. And our IT systems, having to have, having to do it both ways uh, in the IT systems, whether it's providing backup documentation or how plan, what plans are selected, which ones aren't. I mean, it does create complexity and the complexity adds to mistakes and mistakes add to frustration different things so it's it does make it easier and just think about what i, mean, I, I around, just think yeah. about what yeah. i opened the meeting with about the well, intersection well, between yeah, and said for people is that extra five minutes yes yeah mm -hmm. but like that doesn't ex that that is much easier to manage in a singular program than right. having to look at our eligibility system are you waived in sub it's still enrolled in pev it's like well it's all one account now um and think of all the work that was spent on dual enrollment and managing the dual enrollment prohibition. That doesn't exist in a singular. I mean, it exists, but in a different way, in a simpler way, yeah. if it's all one program. So there's just, there's all of those pieces that are, would be much more administratively simple and allow and free up those five minutes times 10 people times multiple weeks to go, oh, we can work on this instead. One last question. This is easy. The July 18th with the stakeholders, can we get a, is it a Zoom, is there a Zoom link for it? If we can invite the board. Yes, so Jessica can send that out. Um, just for. No, I just want yeah. to like listen in. Yeah, it'll be somewhat similar. This yeah. general info session is going to draw a lot off of this presentation. Um, the stakeholders, just you know, the range that we're invited to this um, right. is sub labor, PEB labor, PEB benefits administrators, sub benefits administrators, yeah. carriers, community organizations, legislative staff, enough that when the invite went out, some people emailed and said, is this real or are you spearfishing? Because it was such a wide range right. of emails that were on it that didn't seem like uh, necessarily related that people were like, I, I don't know that this is legitimate. Yeah. Uh, I thought it was interesting to email me ask if I was spearfishing them, because what am I going to say? No, yes, <laughs> I, if I was, if I was, if, yeah, would I say extra? But it's like, responded with the, no, right. Well, <laughs> it's left it. Yeah, so, so uh, but a very wide range. I think we had, had somewhere between 100 to 150 invites to go out. So we can certainly um, include the board as well. But that, it's a general session to um, level set with people. And then we have regularly scheduled meetings for many of those organizations. We have a bi monthly PEB BA meeting. Well, we're actually that now, uh, but we have a bi-monthly sub BA meeting. We have labor organizations. We have retiree. We have a regular cadence of meetings, and we're going to be leveraging those for these. And then we're going to be inserting additional meetings for the stakeholders that we don't have some sort of regular engagement for. Donna. All right. Seems like we're going to board structures and looking at the three different options. This has been a great opportunity for classified staff to actually have representation on this board. Um, and I know that it's very generic in the 13 members, school employees, school employees, that the, the 15 member one specifically does list classified. And I just want to say that I, I really value that uh, because we have representation. I felt listened to at these meetings. And I really think that some of the insight that a classified employee, hourly employee, can give to the board is important. My other question was about the single portfolio of benefits. Um, we talked about you might lose some benefit, but you might have a lower premium too. Um, will when they come, if they choose to go to this single, with that all those the rich the richness of ours compared to the to the PEP side and vice versa, 
all that stuff would be looked at, right? And then that board would decide which, when negotiations come for the next year. I would say be... yes, and it would have to be taken into account as to the overall pot of money that is allocated for the legislature. Uh, so if, you know, I've, when we started, I think one of the very first questions we had to address, I just keep looking at Allison as one of the, the people who was in the room, uh, was the motion can, can, the, can the money, can we just keep spending? You know, like we want to have the richest benefits possible. It's like, well, there, there's this assumption that you're spending the same rough amount of money as in the PET program. And that's how the program set for it was like the, the, you know, it's $2 billion to spend. You can't go back and ask for 2.2, you can't ask for 2.3. The assumption is that you have the same general pot of money that exists in PEB. And so that's why we started all the conversations with, with the sub board about, here's what PEB looks like and here's where you can make variance from it because we have to have the assumption that you're starting spending a similar amount of money. So if the assumption is at the end of the day, there's this amount of money, it's like, does it go as far to cover having the same enriched benefits for everybody? Or does the legislature in its allocation of money recognize that difference and increase the pot of money so that there's not a cut from the experience one program has today. But there's also lots of time between now and a multi-year potential consolidation that there could be changes along the way that align some of those benefits. You know, the, the vision benefits today, literally today, are not identical between the two programs. It's embedded and it's standalone. Structurally, there's, and even some of the benefit design is different, but come January 1, 2025, it will be identical. That took three and a half years. We began talking about it on the PEP side, I believe in the 2020 collective bargaining cycle. So there are just, there are pieces in, in motion that might make some of these differences go away before consolidation happens. And then that would be baked into the funding assumptions. The benefit alignment is going to be in the report somewhere. Correct, yes. And I did want to say uh, on your, I anticipated the uh, form of the question you had about the board slide. Um, the, when we describe a 11, 13, and 15 member board, on the 15 we left in the designations for retiree, classified and certificated, and K-12 retiree, because that is exactly how the statute is structured today. The other options that we were describing certainly could have more granular description in statute or not. We just went with keeping it high level. Um, but the legislature or advocates could say, you know, oh, if there's if it's the two 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 equal world, what should be certificated, what should be classified. We didn't want to dive into that. We said school employees equal two two two. We know we'll be advocating for that. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions for Kate? Comments? <clears throat> Kate, thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, board. Next up, we have a Medicare update, Ellen Wolfhagen, uh, retiree benefits manager, and her is going to give us an update on that program's Medicare portfolio, tab seven. Good morning. Thank you, Chair McDermott, members of the board. Um, as Chair McDermott said, I'm Ellen Wolfhagen. I'm the retiree benefits manager. Next slide, please. Today, we're going to talk about a little Medicare review and then changes that we made to UMP Classic Medicare, and then finally, um, an overview of the entire Medicare portfolio. Next slide, please. So whenever I talk about Medicare, as educators, you will understand that I have to go through the alphabet and sort of start at the beginning. And so Medicare Part A is inpatient services. It includes hospitals and nursing homes, skilled nursing facilities, um, things like that. Um, including mental health as well. And Part B is outpatient yeah. services, primary care specialists, day surgery, vaccines, infusions, durable medical equipment. There's a lot that's in uh, Part B, also including behavioral health. And Part D is prescription drug coverage. Next slide, please. Currently, UMP Classic Medicare has creditable drug coverage. That means drug coverage that is at least as cost effective as Part D. Um, and that was a um, category that was created by CMS to say, we don't want seniors paying more for drugs than they would have if they used Part D. So we want to be sure that there's some 
equality in terms of cost effectiveness. Yes. It says half. I will explain why it said that. <laughs> <laughs> because the PEP board voted on April 11th to convert to Part D coverage beginning January 1, 2025. So through the end of 2024, people on UMP Classic Medicare will still have creditable drug coverage, but starting January 1, it will become Part D coverage. Um, and the reason that we've done that is um, there are minimal changes to the drugs and network uh, pharmacies, um, but the real push is there are additional federal subsidies that result in overall premium savings. And it was really the easiest, fastest way that we could squeeze down the rising premiums in UMP Classic Medicare. Next slide, please. So again, the prime uh, motivator here was downward pressure on the premiums. It was the change that could be implemented by January 1, 2025. As your previous discussion showed, it takes a long time to make changes in benefits or plans or uh, anything like that. The Inflation Reduction Act, the IRA, was passed um, at the federal level that changes the calculation of maximum out-of-pocket for Part B. Um, to true out-of-pocket. And what that means is that members will reach that out-of-pocket limit sooner um, and they will benefit because at that point they pay $0 for any of their prescriptions going forward for the rest of the plan year. Um, Part D plans, all sorts of Part D plans, commercial plans, standalone plans, plans embedded in different kinds of Medicare plans, um, and take advantage of federal price negotiations. The federal government is currently engaged in those and we've already seen some positive movement there. And there's a cap on Part D plan premium increases year over year. Um, again, this change will result in lower costs overall for members. So a lot of the cost share uh, co-pays will go down. And there are very minimal negative impacts, some specialty drugs, and then a few pharmacies that will no longer be available, but have readily available alternatives. Next slide, please. Ellen, as we move on, I just wanted to give uh, the board a snapshot on what, what we mean by the premium downward pressure that's happening in the portfolio and what really led to this. So each of the last two years, UMP Classic Medicare has seen a roughly 20 to 22% premium increase year over year. Um, and we shared with the PEP board um, two weeks ago that if we had stayed on the creditable drug coverage path, that the premium for a single subscriber on UMP Classic Medicare would have gone from the current roughly $545-ish per month to $711 a month. But with this Part B D change that they authorized, it will drop to four hundred and about fifty-five. So it's a swing of almost $250 in premium per month per enrollee. And so this was a very powerful lever that the board could pull to try to uh, address some of the escalating premiums and get a few of these pieces that are uh, protective measures under the IRA um, that can help maybe stabilize premiums to some extent. But if we're, we're talking about a, a, almost, a, I think, another 30% increase. So we would have had three years in a row of really escalating premiums. Um, it was you know, causing a lot of people to really move to other parts of the portfolio. Um, and so there's a significant concern about the long-term viability of that plan as well. So, you know, we've had big increases that uh, talked about here, and that was happening year over year over year in the Medicare population. That's really escalated the timeline for working on this. In terms of the implementation, we are preparing for the automatic migration of current UMP Classic Medicare members so that they do not have to fill out a form or take any action if they're currently in UMP Classic Medicare and they want to stay there. Um, and then members can switch into or enroll in UMP Classic Medicare with Part D and their forms must be received by November 25th. Uh, members who need to make changes can also do so on uh, benefits 24-7 in terms of adding or dropping dependents or adding or dropping dental coverage. Just a note, in terms of vision coverage, uh, vision is still included under medical for Medicare plans. 
So all the Medicare population has sufficient coverage under Medicare. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so at a very high level, an overview of the available um, options in the Medicare portfolio, we have coordination of benefits plans, um, of Medicare pays primary, and you must be enrolled in Medicare Parts A and Part B. Um, we have Medicare Advantage plans. These are employer group waiver plans. That's the most significant phrase for discussing the Medicare Advantage in this realm because that means that as the employer group, PEP can negotiate different benefits, better benefits, or control over um, consequences that happen. We have more of an interaction with the plans, the carriers. Um, so there are a lot of benefits that make this different than your commercial, this is not your grandfather's Medicare Advantage plan. Um, there are things that make uh, employer group waiver plans known as egg whips different than commercial uh, Medicare plans, Medicare Advantage plans. Um, Medicare Advantage plans can include Part D coverage. Um, I will just make a note that there is um, something before the board for tomorrow um, that would change uh, some of the plans to that. Medicare A and B are offered covered services, but also additional benefits. So generally speaking, it's hearing, vision, gym membership. It's those kinds of additional benefits that members are looking for. And Medicare supplement plans are sometimes called Medigap plans. These are intended just to cover the copay, the 20% copay not paid by Medicare. Medicare pays 80% of your uh, costs, and these plans would cover the 20% not paid. They cover only the medical services and only things covered by Medicare. So there's no hearing, there's no vision, there's no um, massage, there's no chiropractic, generally speaking, um, and um, there is no drug coverage in a Medigap plan. So if you have a Medigap plan, which is plan G in our portfolio, you must get a standalone Part D plan off of the commercial market. Or face a potential penalty. Or face a, a, a lifetime penalty, then, yeah. <laughs> so the, I mean, there is there, there are there are choices. <laughs> there is that. And with that, as a point of personal privilege, I'm just gonna say this is my last meeting um ever because um I am retiring at the end of the year. I was gonna I was gonna acknowledge that for Ellen. Ellen's been a guest star here at the sub board. She's been a series regular for years and seasons um with the, the pet board, but uh, She's really helped us write the ship on and navigate quite a lot of issues um, in, the, in the concerns that and engagement with retirees about the Medicare portfolio for the past couple of years um, and really helped us get on a solid path going forward. So just really appreciate all of her work um, for your retirees who you don't have jurisdiction over, but are, I think, interested in knowing what happens to them. Are you presenting tomorrow? Yes, I am. Yeah, she said last, but she meant last year. Okay, I was just like, hello, thank you. Thank you. Dave, do you want to talk about the uh, finalized schedule for 2025? Sure. Um, tab but, number eight. Behind tab eight, same exact schedule I brought to you three weeks ago. Um, I'm not going to go through all the details I went through before, but just remember that we have scheduled every week in July for next year because we don't know exactly which weeks we'll need. This year we're fortunate that we're ending the first meeting in July and we're canceling the other ones for the, the that were um, authorized. Um, most likely we'll use two of those for next year but just kind of keep them all on your on, on your books for now and as we know more later in next year's season we'll we'll give you insights about potentially canceling it but this is the schedule. Um, we've filed it with the code revisor so we're all good from an open public meetings perspective all the way through this time. Well next July. So mark your calendars. The other um, points that I wanted to make about closing with, as part of my aspects of closing the meeting was uh, I had not realized Terry wasn't going to be here today, but Terry has indicated that she is ready to um, retire from the board. So Alice, that means you're the last one standing as the original <laughs> person. The Don't get any ideas. Um, <laughs> but I uh, wanted to thank Terry for her service officially uh, as one of the two remaining original subboard members, and then there was one, um, Agatha Christie. Uh, again, don't get any ideas, broke her in. 
uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, but but Terry has been a great voice speaking about classified staff over the years from the inception and really um, advocating for a, a variety of different aspects of the original decisions with the board and just wanted to publicly um, thank her for her um, years of service uh, to school employees as she transitions off board. Absolutely. And especially those first couple of years, those were long. Mm -hmm. We were doing... Do you still have the numbers in your head? I don't have them. I don't have those numbers. He had the numbers in his head. How many hours? How many meetings? It was uh, way it, too many. It was <laughs> it was a time job. And it left some scars. <laughs> and uh, you know we do this for a living. And so for the board members to come and volunteer their time and come down was amazing. Eight hours. Eight yeah. hours every month, every four weeks. Yeah, for two and a half years. <laughs> it was tough. <laughs> Do we have anyone where the public comment period of the meeting? Are there individuals in Zoom land who would like to make comments? Fred Yancey. Mr. Yancey. Good morning. Fred. Good afternoon or mid morning, whatever you want to say. Uh, Fred Yancey on behalf of Washington State School Retirees and the Washington Association School Administrators. Uh, Things I would like to bring, I'd like to mention to the board. Uh, one is uh, certainly uh, I would like to convey from the retiree perspective the appreciation we've had for the expertise and professionalism that Ellen has shown um, throughout her entire interactions with the retirement community. Certainly, greatly appreciate her work and uh, and uh, wish she wasn't leaving, but fully understand that. Uh, She's well, it's a well-deserved, but thanks very much to her. My my other question is, and, I, and I, I'm not sure how to say it tactfully, but uh, regarding the uh, consolidation report, um, I think it misses the boat. Uh, it does a great job of showing options, but really the most, you know, the most important value of the report came with the discussion from the board at the end and uh, and David's remarks about uh, why do this report? I mean, you do it because the legislature has mandated it, but but what do you get out of a consolidation? You know, you detailed the way it looks in various options, but what do you get out of those? And, you know, and there's nothing in, at least in today's presentation that talked about that. You know, are there cost savings? You know, are there, uh, you've mentioned administrative simplification. You mentioned, uh, you know, IT might be simplified. I mean, why would you do this? If I was a legislator and got today's report, I'd go, well, thank you for sharing, and then just move on. There's there's nothing in there. And I understand you don't make recommendations. That's not what I'm arguing for. What I'm arguing for is why do this? You know, what is the healthcare authority and ERB determine would be the pluses and the minuses should a consolidation occur? That part of analysis I find missing in today's report. Thank you very much for your time. Appreciate your comments, Fred. Others? Seeing no others, this is the last board meeting for 2024. Our next board meeting will be January 23 of 25 with the same attendance or uh, the same format of attendance in person or via Zoom. Dave, any final comments? I try to do preview coming attractions six months is a hard time, but we'll talk about whatever happened in open enrollment, where we are on benefits 24 seven stabilization. The actual report that will have been finalized and just upside today is a high level summary. Many, many more words are going to be in the report and I appreciate all of your feedback as well as, as Fred's during public comment. Um, but we'll give you a copy of the report. We'll talk about what the actual report really had. Uh, there'll be budget proposals from the outgoing and new gubernatorial administration to talk about. Legislative session will start it, so there's plenty of things that we'll be talking about, but it'll be, we'll have an educational aspect still to be determined, but we'll go through where we are on ledge session, the budget, the report, and open enrollment and how things went. So, awesome. Dave, thank you so much. Thank you to your staff. Thank you to board members. You know, these seasons, they, they kind of, by the time you get to the end, they feel kind of long. And then they seem to come pretty quick, but uh, I think it was a good season and I appreciate all the candid input. Um, I am reflecting back to some of our original meetings. Not a lot of talking. Board was very quiet. <laughs> and it was because we were 
the, the agency was really dumping a lot of stuff on it and it was a lot of shell shocked and you know um it was it was very one way and now i like to see the interaction that goes back and forth understanding the perspectives that help shape the policy it shall help shape the direction it also helps shape the conversations that uh, we're all not a part of that are happening behind the scenes with our legislative staff with our ofm partners and things like that so Really appreciate your input and hope you all have a uh, safe drive home and we'll see you in 2025. 20, yeah, yeah. That's not, that doesn't sound like a real number. <laughs> no, uh, but yeah, 2025. Take care, folks. This meeting's adjourned. <laughs>